Good afternoon. Uh, today is a special joint meeting of three advisory boards, the Public Works Advisory Board, the Citizens Finance Advisory Board, and the Water Reclamation Facility Citizens Advisory Committee. So welcome, today is Monday, June 25th. We are at the Morro Bay Community Center, it's 3 p.m. I would like to uh, establish a quorum uh, for the two committees I'm responsible for today, CFAC and WERFCAC. We have a quorum present and call the meeting to order for our boards. And then I would like to turn it over to the chair of the PWAB who will open it for his board. Thank you. The uh, members of the Public Works Advisory Board are all present except for Christian Erlinson, so we do have a quorum. Next item on the agenda is the public comment for items on the agenda. Now there's a, been a little discussion whether you want to do your, whether the public would like to do their comments before the presentation or after the presentation. So um, the chair and I are both open to what the um, public would like to do. Uh, if you could give me a show of hands as if you would like to do it before the presentation, raise your hand now. If you would like to do it after the presentation, please raise your hands. Okay, it looks like the majority would like to do it after the presentation. So with that, we will move to item one, review of the proposed water and sewer rate increases. Give it to the staff. Thank you, uh, Scott Collins, city manager. Thank you, chairperson uh, Spagnola, chairperson uh, Dreschler, thank you all of the committee members present from the WARFCAC, CFAC, and PWAB for their flexibility and being able to come together to have a meeting, a joint meeting today on this very important topic. Um, many of you were present at the meeting, a community meeting on Saturday. We had a really good turnout to discuss um, the rates as well. Uh, in that presentation we provided to the community, we did do a bit of um, looking back, uh, kind of the, the council goals, the community goals related to this project, as well as um, answering some of the questions that are still out there about the project. But in the interest of time and really getting down to the matter of, of hand is with the rates, we, we figure we can move quickly into the, the rate discussion since we have Alex Handler, our rate consultant here, who's gonna provide a bit more detail than was provided on Saturday. Um, but just briefly wanted to touch on a few things. As you all know, the, the project is in a very critical stage at this point. The location has been, preferred location has been identified. We're making progr steady progress towards submitting application for the Water Innovation Financing Infrastructure Act or WIFIA Low Interest Loan Program. We've hired a new program manager. We're making progress on our draft EIR um, in addition to some other uh, proceedings regarding the project. Now since 2017, uh, there was a, an original project estimate of $167 million. That project estimate has moved down to $126 million through a variety of, of um, efforts. Uh, WARFCAC subcommittee, WARFCAC in general, thank you for your participation in reviewing the preferred proposers and, and helping bring down those costs. In addition to city council and the community, requesting a um, kind of a pause last year to look at uh, kind of the experts and seeing if there are things we can do to, to take off, shave off the project to bring those costs down. Um, as we're entering into this discussion, I think it's important to note that the, the community has raised a lot of questions about the costs uh, and the rates and that we felt is very important to have multiple opportunities for engagement, uh, both on Saturday, today, City Council on Thursday, and at least one more meeting um, next, probably on July 10th, regarding rates. Um, ultimately, uh, the rate study was developed through a couple of very key, important uh, components. The first being our Barta Wells associate, uh, Alex Handlers, who's here today, who's provided us services in the past for rate studies, including the 2015 rate study. In addition to city staff here is before you today, including our finance director, Jane Calloway, public works director, Rob Leivik, our utilities division manager out in the audience, Joe Mueller, myself, um, and, and a new wrinkle this, this time around was the inclusion of a blue ribbon commission uh, of four members of the community who have vast experience in finance and business uh, and, and a keen understanding of our community to really 
look at every line item, every assumption built into the rate study that you're about to get more details on today and really challenge the city on our assumptions and make sure that we bring forward not only rates that can support the project, support ongoing operations and maintenance, and support a capital improvement program that truly does address our most pressing needs, but to do so in a way that our community can afford. And the Blue Ribbon Commission took that challenge to heart and did deliver recommendations to myself uh, through a report last week which de determined from their perspective that the rates with all those things considered are reasonable. Alex Handlers is here today um, to, to kind of talk in more detail, but at the high level, what we're talking about is a $41 surcharge for the wharf project, which is, takes an average rate payer, combined sewer and water from 150, which was planned for uh, July 1st, 2019, would, would translate into a $191 bill for the average rate payer. That's a uh, single family resident, residents who consume five units of water, which is about you know, approximately two thirds of our, our residents fall within that or under that amount. Um, this would go into effect again July 1st, 2019 if it, it went through uh, successfully through the 218 process. Um, this would fully fund the project in total. This would provide a million dollar investments in both water and sewer uh, improvements each year and fund our operations and maintenance at the current staffing levels. Um, again, I want to thank the advisory committees here today for your important work, um, as well as the Blue Ribbon Commission for their work and Wharf CAC for their, for their work leading up to this moment. So with that, I would like to turn the presentation over to our rate consultant, Alex Handlers, and um, after um, we get through the presentation, we'll let uh, maybe some clarifying questions, but ultimately get to the audience because I'm sure they have a lot of questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, nice to see folks again. Um, so today we're, we're I want to present kind of the draft findings, and I think uh, Scott just gave away my uh, results here. So <laughs> but that was going to be the first thing we covered. But. You know, really the point of today is to present these are preliminary findings. We've been working with city staff, with Corolla engineers. We've got a lot of good questions and input from the Blue Ribbon Commission who, who asked a lot of good questions and, and pushed on a lot of stuff. So we think we're at a point where we're getting close. Might not be final yet where we're going with this. We wanted to get everyone else's input as well. Um, and we can work that in. As in terms of a little background before I go on is, you know, the last time you did rate increases was back in 2015. The city adopted a phase in of five years of water and sewer rate increases. And you know, there's talk, I know there's talk in the community, hey, why didn't those rates work? People said that was gonna fund the facility. Well, we went back and we looked at what were the assumptions used at the time. It was just kind of a conceptual project back then. So no one had really definitive cost estimates at the time. Uh, the, the rates were designed to support a facility that cost $75 million. But wait a minute, that assumed Cayucos was contributing 25% of that, so it really was only designed to fund Morro Bay's share of costs equal to about $56 million. And it didn't include the funding for the recycled water project. That was also kind of conceptual estimates at the time. Those weren't expected to phase in until kind of a phase two in later years. So. Where we're at now is that the, no question the city's facing a lot higher funding needs. The old rates obviously aren't going to be adequate. The old rates, by the way, also assumed 100% you know, funding you can get from the state revolving fund, which is a very low rate state subsidized funding program. The money used to be you know, relatively easy to get, but these days it's, it's a real challenge. Your project ticks off a lot of their high priority boxes. Now they're looking, they're oversubscribed by billions of dollars in other agencies trying to get this funds, but you've had success so far um, getting an SRF planning loan, and when we, we spoke with them recently, you know, they won't guarantee anything, but it sounded more favorable than I've heard from other agencies when we talked to them about other agencies. But we're not banking on anything at this stage of the game because unfortunately nothing may be there. So that kind of leads us today. What we did was update the financial projections build in the new project costs and timing, um, build in what we know about the financing. The city was invited to submit uh, for a WIFI loan. You were one of 12 
agencies in the country to be invited to do that, which is very impressive. A lot of agencies wanted this money because there are tremendous infrastructure needs out there right now, expensive projects all over. Like you, you have to build a new treatment plant. So do many other agencies in California, and for some of them, it's it's not 100 million, it's, you know, 500 million, a billion. Unfortunately, yours is a high cost for the population of your size, which is um, kind of putting the pressure on here financially. Um, so what we did, we developed a few different financial scenarios based on the different types of funding. Uh, all the scenarios assume that this project's gonna be funded by a combination of sources. WIFI will provide you up to 49%. Um, depending on what you do with your rates, they, are, they have some funding built into them. The city's built up a little bit of reserves and there's two more rate increases, one this upcoming fiscal year, another one next year, now they're, you know, I think around seven, eight percent increases, so not huge increases, but altogether, these, uh, the rates, the increases, and these proposed, what we're proposing today are separate water reclamation facility surcharges to fund the facilities. Just want to be clear about that, because I realized there was some confusion on Saturday. Um, so we're not touching the existing rates. Those are in place, those are adopted. What we're looking at proposing now to help fund the remainder of their facility is a completely separate surcharge for water and sewer to kind of top it off. And as uh, Scott mentioned, the, we're talking a, a charge of about $41 a month under our base case scenario. But I'm, I'm gonna talk about a few scenarios here. It's gonna it's too complicated if I try to show them all. But we did develop cash flows for four scenarios. The base case assumes the WIFI of funding it assumes you're contributing cash as can be generated from rates and the surcharge, and it assumes uh, that you'd have to use revenue bonds to kind of fill in the missing remainder, because uh, we're not assuming that you're gonna get any additional state revolving fund loans or any other kind of you know, magical grants that would happen to fall in your lap. Under the base case scenario, we assume that you charge the full surcharge, not this upcoming fiscal, this, this upcoming fiscal year, but starting the subsequent fiscal year. So kind of nothing this year, then the whole thing kicks in, and that's gonna generate the most cash financing your, for your project. A couple of scenarios that uh, you know, came out of the work with the city and the commission, hey, let's look at a phase-in scenario where uh, we're phasing it in over a few years. Again, no charge next year, but then if, instead of implementing the whole you know, 40 plus dollars, it might phase in you know, 20, 30, 40, something along those lines. We did look at two other scenarios. Hey, what if you got SRF financing instead of bonds to, fix, to kind of cover the remainder of the project? And obviously that results in the state revolving fund loan as right now the interest rate's below 2%. So that results in less debt service and a little bit lower rates. Not tremendously lower, but you know, a little bit. And then finally, there's, you know, I know there's talk, hey, what can we do to, to keep costs down for the community? Maybe we can drop off the recycled water projects. There's, you know, roughly 20 million, I think, of recycled water projects. Uh, and if you eliminated them, certainly the project costs do go down. You don't have to build the recycled water facility. And if it's about 10 million, you can shave, you know, roughly 10 million out of the treatment plant for some of the advanced treatment that was, was being needed. Um, but at the end of the day, the project costs go down. But without recycling, uh, you're not taking off any of these priority boxes for state revolving fund loan the WIFIA project that you were one of the very few agencies to be invited to submit the full application. Um, who knows what happens with that? I, I don't even, the recycle is kind of an in, integral component of making yourself look good for some of these funding programs. So without it, you might not get these. I've just been reminded, I'm, when I talk about a, a fixed, we're talking about a separate um, surcharge for the water reclamation facility of about $40, $41 a month. I'll just show it on the next page. Uh, that's the first, the base case scenario where you, you charge the full rate starting, not this year, but next one year down the line. Um, there's also, the, what we're talking about is fixed charges for single family residential customers this is a project, these are fixed debt service costs. You need to demonstrate a, you know, a solid repayment security. So very similar to how your sewer rates are currently charged, there'd be fixed charges. But for the commercial customers, it's, it's very impossible to come up with a fixed charge that's gonna have any, any way to make sure they're paying their proportionate share also. So 
uh, kind of like what you have with your sewer rates, there's fixed residential charges, volumetric uh, uh, surcharges would be on the commercial customers. But anyway, we look at the, the alternatives, and, and Scott already cut to the chase. Under the base case scenario, we're talking about a surcharge of $41 above your existing rates. Now, if you wanted to phase in these surcharges, you're going to have less cash to the project, a little bit more debt, a little more debt service. The charges need to go a little bit higher. We calculate $44 if it was phased in. When we look at what's the benefits of getting a state revolving fund load instead of having to use bonds to finance you know, the remainder chunk of the project, uh, we're talking about a $7 monthly savings over if bonds were used. And finally, when we look at the no recycling alternative, as we can see on this table here, the surcharge is $44, so it's the same as the phase in scenario. However, the surcharge is higher because there's more cost being put on the wastewater system, and that's what it would take. But if you flip over and look at the water side, you wouldn't need to implement your last year of water rate increases. So the net effect is the, the no recycling is about a buck fifty savings. Now we know everything's built on a lot of assumptions. We try to be fair and use reasonable assumptions in everything we did. But you know, think of that, the dollar fifty savings for uh, is what you would save by not doing the recycled water project is a rough estimate. You know, it could be a dollar, could be two dollars a month, somewhere in that range. Um, the other thing everyone wants to know is what's our total bill with these surcharges? Well, with the total bill, folks would continue to pay their, their regular water and sewer rates, and they'd also pay the additional you know, 40 to $45 surcharge, depending on what scenario we're looking at. So the total bill would increase from a current level. Well, as of July 1st, you have a rate increase kicking in. So a typical single-family home using five units per month, and as Scott mentioned, your, your, uh, the, the average single family use over this past year is about four and a half per units. Um, so about two thirds of the customers are at or below this level. We're talking about a combined all in single family charge next year of $1.3950. And then when the surcharge kicks in and your last rate kick in, that would bump that up to $191 all in and your rates would stay at that level for five years. Might you need future inflationary cost escalation at some point down the line? Of course, it's always possible, and you'll evaluate that down the line, but it's looking like these would be the maximum charges for the next five years, 191 under the base case scenario where you instantly start charging that full surcharge in a couple of years. The phase-in, um, it gradually ramps up, but it ramps up to a little bit higher place, so on this, chart here you can see at the bottom the total charge ramps up you know next year coming up 139.50 to 167 to 180 eventually up to 194 at the end of the day and the city's going to continue to evaluate these rates in future years because if you do get SRF or you know you might not to need to ramp in the full surcharge but at this stage of the game you need to get rates adopted to demonstrate you've got the financial security in place to get the WIFI loan and bonds and anything else you need, because WIFI is not going to award you one cent unless you've got the, play, the rates to demonstrate you can repay them and uh, other funding sources, and you do not have any state revolving fund loan long-term financing in hand other than that, the, the, uh, the short-term planning loan. Um, total cost of the project, uh, we're now estimating 122.8 million is Corolla's latest estimates. About five million is spent so far, so that leaves 117 million to go. And that's including the construction costs as well as soft costs and a little bit of project reserves for unanticipated unknowns, which invariably uh, often come up with these large projects. Uh, costs are gonna be phased in over the next four years. It's pursuant to a design build. A lot of design is in the first couple of years. In the blue, as you can see there, the soft costs. And the build is the orange. So really a lot of construction costs, not next year, but starting two years down the line when the project uh, is, it's gonna be a big project that's gonna have a lot of, a lot going on there. But so the project's gonna be done. The goal is uh, that it would come online, I guess, uh, be complete around October 2022 or 2021 and come online on January 2022 in time to meet your permit requirements. There's also operating costs associated with this. Now, when we, 
Uh, Corolla Engineers has estimated what this facility would cost to operate, and it's not all that different from what your current plant costs to operate. The other side of the coin is though, with Cayucos going its own way, they're not contributing 25%. And a lot of the costs at the treatment plant are fixed costs, so even though the flow might be down, uh, doesn't mean that the costs are going down proportionally. Maybe they shave off a little bit of costs. Uh, there's also uh, needs to be some additional conveyance costs built in to pump the wastewater from the where it's currently collected up to the, the new facility. So that's about 250,000 a year under current estimates. We escalated that to when the conveyance would start. It's about 277,000 a year. And the final thing is the recycled water operations. They're about 200,000 a year. Again, we're building in a little bit of cost escalation in our financial projections for when it comes online, but um, those are built in as well. Um, how much of the project is water versus recycled water? Well, at the end of the day, Corolo did an assessment and they allocated everything to recycled water that wouldn't normally have been done for wastewater alone. So any of the incremental costs, and it's not a small amount because you have to build some separate recycled water facilities, but there are you know, some costs at the treatment plan as well as some costs um, for the separate facilities. And the recycled water worked out to be about 29% of the total project costs. That portion of project costs would be funded on the water side of the equation with water surcharges. The sewer side would fund its own sewer charges, so everything's kept separate and independent. I mean, I've talked about the project sources. This pie chart kind of shows it graphically. WIFIA will fund up to 49%, and I, I would imagine that's that's what you're going to go for because that's probably going to be the best deal you can get for that 49% of the funding. Um, you've already received an award of an SRF planning loan for $10.3 million. That currently has a 10-year payback. It's a 1.7% interest rate. But if you were to get longer-term SRF financing, that, the repayment of that could be spread over 30 years and rolled into the longer-term SRF loan. Uh, but we're not assuming that in our, our base case scenario. We're assuming you'd have to get revenue bonds to supplement whatever else is out there. Uh, luckily, it only works out to be about 20% of project costs would need to be funded by revenue bonds after you take into account the WIFI loan, the planning loan, and cash funding that you've already generated and will continue to generate because your rates are ramping in, generating more and more money each year, but the debt service doesn't hit, at least for the WIFI loan, until year five. Some other debt service may hit you a little sooner, so it's enabling you, and I'll show it graphically in a little bit, to build up some excess funding each year. The more cash you can apply to the project, again, the less debt you need to take on, the lower the debt service is at the end of the day, and the lower the rates are gonna be ultimately. In terms of the debt estimates, we've had some questions about what assumptions are you using? And uh, some things we know, your SRF planning loan was, was uh, already awarded at a 1.7% interest rate, which is less than inflation. So that's you know debt service of about a million a year. Uh, the WIFI loan has not been awarded yet. You have been selected to apply, which is very high indication you're gonna get funding. Um, but the rates hasn't been set yet. It's gonna be floating until the agreement is finalized. Right now, the WIFI rates for a loan of 35 years would be about 3%. So we bumped the interest rate up a little bit for planning purposes, understanding what we're putting here, it may be a little higher, it may be a little lower at the end of the day. The next thing is the revenue bonds. Uh, we're assuming 30-year revenue bonds are pretty standard. Um, right now, rates are probably more like four and a quarter but who knows what rates are gonna be when you have to actually issue these bonds. We try to be a little conservative, but we didn't wanna to be too conservative. So we're, we're trying to strike a balance there, so we're not implementing rates that are too high nor, nor too low. We're assuming 4.7%. Uh, when you add all the, the debt together, it works out to be an all-in TIC. It's called the true interest cost. So it's kind of what is a single rate that would represent this full stream of debt service payments. It's, about 3.5%, which is pretty good. And you keep in mind, you could, if you ever take on debt like revenue bonds, you could always refund it in later years. Uh, even if interest rates haven't changed that much, in 10 years, you're looking at a shorter term borrowing you could often get a lower interest rate for. The other thing I wanted to mention is because you've got this 10-year repayment loan coming in, it's gonna be higher debt service payments for the first 10 years. 
but we didn't want to see you have to have higher rates for 10 years that drop away. So uh, what we did in, in our financing structuring is we kind of structured around that 10-year SRF loan to result in level annual debt service payments going out for the next 30 years or so. Um, so that's the base case scenario. I've, as I've mentioned a few times, with a phase in, you're, 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 you're not generating 4.3 million of cash that you would by going up to the, the full surcharge starting next year. So it results in needing to issue 4.3 million of debt and a little less than 300,000 per year of debt service. Sorry to throw too many numbers your way. In addition to funding the water reclamation facility, uh, you've got to fund your ongoing capital needs. You've got an aging uh, water and sewer systems here in Morro Bay, just as with every other uh, agency up and down the state. So what a lot of agencies I work with in recent years have been trying to you know, plan for replacing old pipelines, old pump stations, old water tanks that are, that are on their last legs. And, and you're on the coast, and what I hear from agencies on the coast over and over is that these are different conditions here. You put in a, some kind of booster pump uh, inland, maybe you get 20 years out of it here, you're lucky to get 15. So unfortunately, uh, stuff tends to wear a little quicker. But a lot of the costs for the, the capital improvement programs, this is for you know refurbishing old infrastructure, replacing old infrastructure. You've got some pipelines that are leaking made of old substandard materials. So uh, the city has worked with Corolla engineers to kind of do a good assessment of what needs to happen. And there's new capital improvement programs that have been put out there. And just to summarize the dollar amounts we're looking at, on the water side, the highest priority stuff is about 6.8 million over the next five years. So it averages about 1.3 million per year. Um, and then long term, it's about a million a year. Sewer, very so similar numbers there too. We're looking about a million per year, uh, maybe a little lighter once you get out past 10 years, but it's kind of premature to tell. These are in current dollars. So, um, you know, 10 years down the line with cost inflation, the cost may be a little bit higher. So we, 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 we did build in a little bit of cost inflation for this, but we're uh, trying to keep the capital projects to address what you need and keep it to a minimum so you can keep the rates as low as possible. So I mentioned we developed financial projections and those, the details are going to be in the report that gets sent out to everybody uh, showing the different financial scenarios. But this kind of shows it graphically. So we try to build in the latest and greatest information possible, everything we know about the operating costs, the capital costs. We built in 4% cost escalation and we put it all together and see where your rates need to go. This first chart there's a few different colors on there I'll just mention. One is your O&M expenses that are going to be ramping up. This is for the, um, the sewer side of the equation, which is the bulk of it. Um, you've got cost inflation of 4%, and you also have, um, on top of that, some conveyance costs that are going to kick in when the treatment facility kicks online to, to transport the waste. Next up is the, the green section. That's the debt service that you'd be taking on for the water reclamation facility, the sewer portion of the debt service. And you can see that's a big, that generates a big increase in what your future funding needs are. The yellow is the ongoing pay-go capital improvements. Again, roughly a million a year, a little bit higher in the first five years. You've got to replace some water tanks and some other high in critical infrastructure. And then the purple. That purple is very important from my perspective. That represents the cash that you're able to generate to the project. Now, you can see the red line, that represents the total revenues under the base case scenario. Under the base case scenario, that full surcharge kicks in starting 1920. So in addition to what you're currently generating with, with your uh, rates, the surcharge is gonna kick that up and you're gonna be generating a substantial amount for the project. You know, debt service and, and capital needs kick in that reduces that in some other years, but. Um, this is a lot of money you can generate. And this purple here, it goes above the line, so it means you're, you're, you're spending more than you're taking in in revenues that, this year. So we assumed uh, while you're going through the project, you don't want to spend down your fund reserves in these early years because you don't know what's going to happen in the later years. But as this project's coming to a tail end, that would be the time when uh, the city can opt 
how much does it want to spend down of its fund reserves and, and keep the rest in the bank? And we assumed you'd spend down about another four million with the goal of keeping four million dollars in reserves in the water and sewer side. I know that's a little higher than the kind of the fund reserve targets that were recently established, but um, it's prudent to maintain fund reserves if you've got them because who knows what's happening in the future, uh, especially when you're going to have so much debt service out there in addition to your operating capital needs. This is the same chart, but it, it, it shows it for the, the water enterprise. And some of the key things there that are happening, in addition to the, the dark blue, the O&M escalating, you also have big payments that you're paying for state water project. And a big portion of those payments is paying bonds for the Central Coast Water Authority bonds. Luckily, those bond payments disappear after five more years. So that's over 600,000 a year that's falling away at the same time as the debt service is kicking in for your water reclamation facility. So there's a little bit of offset there, there that reduces the, the need for the water rates. Um, on the water side, not as much being generated for capital needs, but again, this is the base case scenario with a big bump up initially. Uh, then we're also showing the phase in scenario. So with the phase in, the rates don't bump right up next year. They go up a little more gradually. So you're not quite generating as much, 4.3 million less from water and sewer towards the projects. This slide here shows what the resulting surcharges would be in a little more detail. And now I'm talking sewer water reclamation facility surcharges under the base case scenario. I mentioned it would be a fixed charge for residential customers. And just like your sewer rates, you have a, a fixed charge for single family dwelling units and a reduced charge that's 80% of that for multifamily dwelling units and condos. On the non-residential side, uh, commercial customers would pay volumetric rates based on usage that would be based on their customer class. Lower strength customers pay less, higher strength pay more. And we just paralleled the city's existing sewer rate structure with this. Those commercial charges would be subject to a minimum charge $20 a month, which is the same minimum charge that the residential customers have to pay. But with the base case, again, nothing next year, but the whole charge hits in 2019-20. Under the phase-in scenario, instead of having the whole charge hit in 2019-20, it would phase in over a few years. And this is just kind of a sample phase-in. We might tweak that a little bit. I know we've kind of gone back and forth on what the appropriate phase-in would be. But at the end of the day, Instead of the sewer charge going to $25 for a single family home, it has to go a little bit higher, the same proportion on the non-residential side. On the water side, same story. Uh, we're proposing fixed residential surcharges on the water side. You know, it equates to $16 a month uh, for single family homes and 80% you know, of that for multifamily units. Non-residential pays a uniform rate for all water use under this scenario. Again, a rate that's uh, kept in balance with the, the residential increases. The goal of all customer classes are, are paying their fair share. And again, with the phase in, instead of going straight to you know, a rate of 16 next year, you'd, you'd phase in, but you'd end up a tiny bit higher. This slide shows what the total bill would be, the all-in bill that, that was been mentioned already including the monthly water and sewer rates, as well as these water reclamation facility surcharges. And this chart breaks it down. The blue shows the, the water bills. These show different bill, total monthly bills at different levels of use. So one is a low user. Five is kind of a moderate user. The average is about four and a half, going up to what's you know here in Morrow Bay, a high user, someone using 10 units. Yeah, you do have uh, some homes that use that level, but you know, by the time you get up to 10, it's not a lot of homes that are using that level on an ongoing basis. Some it's you know, periodically the summer. And obviously the charges are higher the more you use, but that's really being driven by the water rates. The water rates, uh, the more you use, the more you pay. The sewer charges are fixed charges, the green section, and then you'd have your surcharges layered on on top. Again, a typical single family home, $191 per month under the base case scenario. And as I show on the side there, that the, you know, the bottom three quarters of that is the, the monthly rates and the top part is the surcharge, which can be collected 
by different billing methods, as we'll talk about in a moment. Um, this one shows the phase-in scenario. If it would phased in, it have to go a little bit higher. We're talking a typical single-family charge of $194 per month. In terms of billing alternatives, um, you have, I mean, there's, there's many different alternatives, but we're, we're looking at a really kind of narrowed down to two. Uh, I don't think anyone at this stage is proposing trying to collect current water or sewer charges on the property tax roll. So your current water or sewer charges, the adopted rates, would continue to be charged on monthly billing as they are now. But in addition to that, how are you going to collect these water reclamation facility charges? The two options are one, these could be separate line items that are put on the monthly bills, and two, they could be a separate charge that gets collected on the annual property taxes. Now, they're not, the taxes are just being used as a method of bill collection. And although there's some administrative differences there for how you do this, really from my perspective, the, the fundamental difference is who is the burden falling upon. Right now, you've got some of the repayment for the water reclamation facility already built into the current rates, and you've got some folks out there who are tenants who are not property owners that are paying these bills, but the other side of the, the perspective is, hey, this facility is going to be out there for the next you know, 30 to 50 years. Um, it's benefiting all property owners here in Morrow Bay. And when we look at um, you know, who's most able to pay, you know, obviously you've got a lot of property owners on fixed income. Most of your property owners are the rate payers, so it's the same group of people who are going to fall and pay this bill no matter how you, you slice and dice it. But you certainly do have some folks who are tenants who are paying the charges now who can't afford property here. They're paying rent. The other side of the coin, you've got some property owners that have had property here in a while. Maybe they have a lot of equity built up, but they don't have the income stream coming in to afford a lot. So there's concern there that there's folks who own homes who have fixed incomes. But you know, if they live here in Morrow Bay and have our own fixed income, they're going to have to pay the charge one way or other. Obviously, the city has a low-income discount program, but that's you know it helps a little bit. Every dollar counts, but. It's still going to put, no matter what you do at the end of the day, this is still going to be a significant burden on, on all the rate payers. Yes, it's less than what we thought when we looked at the numbers a year ago uh, when the facility was, uh, for you know, rough engineering estimates, was estimated to cost a lot more, but it's still a significant burden no matter how you slice it and dice it. What I wanted to show here, though, just because we heard some confusion yesterday, what does that mean you're putting it on the property tax rolls? The surcharge, you know, of a little over $40 a month, $41 a month, under the base case scenario works out to be an annual charge of $492 a year. Under the phase in scenario, it's a little bit higher. So roughly $500 per year would be on the, put on the tax rolls if you did it that way. And that gets paid in two installments, one in December and one in April. So we're talking about a $250 bump up on the property tax rolls uh, occurring twice a year as opposed to the monthly surcharges. Also, um, the county's on the teeter plan, meaning when you put a bill on the, on the county tax rolls, they're giving you 100% of the, of the charges. So it's a guaranteed income stream. Now they have said, if there is a high delinquency rate, they can say, hey, wait a minute, we're negating the teeter plan, we're gonna only give you what we're collecting. But that, that rarely, I don't think they've ever done that. So that's always a possibility. Um, so, I mean, there are legitimate alternatives there. So what we're looking for today is, is any input, any questions we're happy to answer, and any guidance you want to provide on where we go with this. So you, you can see what kind of the rates we're looking at, the, the surcharges. Um, if there's any direction there, it would be appreciated. And any input regarding, you know, what folks think is the best way of collecting it. Neither one's perfect, there's pros and cons of both, but it seems like everyone's got a different opinion on what's the best way to go. But I'm just gonna leave it there. Um, there's a report that details all this information. A lot of the tables and charts in here are in that report as well as the detailed cash flows. So folks will be able to see, you know, go through that with a fine tooth comb like the, the Blue Ribbon Commission did. And I will turn it back over to the, the, the joint committee here. Okay, um, before we open it up to the public for public comment, are there any initial questions from members of the Public Work Advisory Board? We'll start with Stu. Okay, 
if you'd like. Does that work? Yes. We okay? Good. Uh, I just have a short page here, and the uh, first thing that concerns me with all this whole scenario is the instability of PG&E. And and maybe, maybe we haven't addressed that. Maybe we have. But they've got some big lawsuits coming up, and we expect their rates to go up with electricity considerably uh, in a short era. And a, uh, we have the ability with a new plant coming out here, with a new location, to generate our own power through, through solar and maybe through wind turbines out there to augment the cost rise in, in pg and &E, which is going to be uh, considerable very shortly. So I think that's something that we need to talk about and maybe see what we could do with the uh, projecting cost and so on. Uh, in regards to the rate for water and wastewater processing, I believe it should be on a monthly bill. And that way, every person is cognizant of how much they're paying. And I'll give you an example. I had a line break in the back of my house, and my water bill that month was over $200 because I had a bunch of water running down the street. So, you know, it's, it's something that everybody needs to be aware of. We don't have an abundant supply of water here. And, and the, uh, if you put it on the monthly bill, uh, it brings things into sharp focus very quickly. Um, There has been some discussion on the internet about some other cities that have, and I'll ask you this question, that have contracted with somebody to do a, a pre-assembled wastewater treatment systems. And they, they do claim that they are less money to do that. I don't know, I didn't, I didn't get into it, but when you get on the internet, that option is available, and it's considerably less money. Uh, it may be less longevity, too, so that's something I think that we should take a look at. Uh, the other issue, of course, uh, one of the other issues is maximum, po <clears throat> maximum population do you see more obey in 30 years by the time this system goes out. Now, we're not growing much, 2% a year or something like that, so not much. Should we build the plant to the capacity of what we project in 30 years, or should we start smaller and add it as we go along? I don't know. That's, that's a question to ask. And that's what I have right now. Any initial questions, Jan? Jan, do you have any? Okay, Christopher. Not at the moment. You want John. to go through these? Pardon me? Can I go through these? Um, these give it a shot. All right, I got a few. Um, um, let me interrupt for a minute. Uh, can we address some of these as they're asked so that we don't forget what the first question is? If, if somebody can. I'm, I'm concerned that you're writing yeah. down all these questions. Per, and perhaps a, another approach would be just to, if there are any clarifying questions based on what was in the presentation. Oh, okay. And to and go to public comment and then come back. Okay. I mean, that, that's just one suggestion, right? Because we could be, if we go through each one of the questions, it may be quite some time before public comment. Okay, so let's go with the, then if Rick agrees, the clarifying questions. Yeah. And I don't think Stu had any of those. So go ahead. Sorry. Oh, that's All right, so for clarifying questions, um, are these bonds which we're considering general fund bonds or uh, enterprise fund bonds? Yeah, the question was, are the, would the bonds be general obligation bonds or would they be bonds that are funded by the water and wastewater enterprise? I'm assuming water and wastewater revenue bonds, that's most commonly what's used for this, so the sewer bonds would be used as needed to supplement the WIFIA and the cash funding for the sewer projects, and same on the water side. Thank you. Uh, CIP. Uh, water and sewer are not the only capital improvement costs which the city is struggling with at this time. Uh, do you want to fill us in on that, Rob? Sure. We have a... Um, 
general fund CIP program, but none of that can be funded out of our water and wastewater enterprise funds. So we have a pavement management program that would be funded through the general fund, um, our facilities improvements general fund. So none of the general fund projects would be funded out of the water or wastewater funds. From what I gather, it's about the same amount of, you know, half our CIP is water and sewer and half of it is the other general funds, is that right? Um, we scale our um, general fund CIP for the amount of funds that are available, so it's probably a little less than the enterprise funds. Now the need might be more, but the amount of funds that we can fund with through the CIP is less. Okay. Um, did your rates include um, interest, the effective interest income on the excess cash we're, cash we're initially uh, collecting? Yes, it did. We used, um, right now, we, we used the rate that's uh, being paid by the local agency investment fund, LAIF, where the city's got some of its money. It's currently about 1.5%, and we assume long term, after a few years, it goes up to 2%. That's not a huge revenue source. It's really the rates that are the revenue source for just about 98% of the revenues at the end of the day. Thank you. Um, so. Did your rate calculations include the payoff of the, the whatever the, the San, uh, Central Coast Water Authorities turn out and also for the state water project uh, payoff? Yes, those, those are all factored in. Um, and it looks like your Central Coast Water Authority bond payments they go out, yeah, five more, it looks like five years, including this year, so four more years after this year, and then they are uh, paid off. What was that, what was the effect of that on the, the rates? That was, uh, that's being paid on the water side, it's, it's $670 a year, they just did a refinancing, 70, oh, 670000 They did a refinancing last year that brought the debt service down a little bit. Um, so 670000 for the next four more years and then it's gone. Uh, how about the state water project? Oh, your state water project, well, the, you've got fixed costs there that are going to go on probably in perpetuity, yeah, so you've got a long time before those phase away and there's, you know, I'm not sure what's going to happen with the uh, peripheral canals and stuff. But. So we're on obligation with the state water project till, through 2038. Um, based on the base contract that uh, the uh, county si signed with DWR and we are, that was passed along to the, to the city. In addition to that, as um, the California water fix moves forward, we'll, we'll have our incremental share, although that's based on our allocation and the overall, you know, um, uh, state water project. It's not a huge cost on state water, um, that uh, California water fix. Okay, uh, let's see. Is there any advantage in planning on prepayment of loans and bonds? Planning on prepayment? Well, um, and we haven't factored into our 10 year projections, but if you do issue revenue, if you get WIFI and SRF, you know, odds are that it's not easy to re refund those because the interest rates are so low, it's hard to generate savings. But yeah, if you did some revenue bonds, and we were estimating, you know, something in the 20 to 25 million range, um, if you can achieve savings down the line, by all means, you could refund. Often the savings is, you know, it doesn't go down tremendously, but it would go down a little bit, and that might offset either what some potential future rate increase, or maybe at some point it brings down what these surcharges are. Later on, I'll probably want to know how these costs compare with Cayucas and Los Osos' current conditions, but not now. Um, then the other thing I kind of want to make a statement is, as a person who lives on a fixed income, this is a 1% increase in my annual costs. So I just wonder if it is going to be something I've got to deal with one way or the other. I have just one simple question. Um, when you're talking about placing it on the property rolls versus on the bills, um, 
on properties, uh, property that has, say, five water meters on it, you know, five tenants, um, are they charged per meter? Um, how, you know, how do we deal with multiple uh, tenants and a uh, single property yeah. owner? You're exactly right. If you have a, a single parcel, but it has a number of different um, tenants on there, they would get the bill for all those separate tenants or all the different uses that are to separate meters. Okay. So, thank you, Barbara. You can take it. Up. Okay, we'll start with uh, CFAC, uh, but John is also on CFAC. We've already heard your questions. So, uh, David Baton, uh, any questions or clarifying questions? Yeah. You, Dave, yeah. Is the cost for the uh, injection wellheads and piping included in the fix, the surcharge for water? on the project, or is that going to be extra, and how will it be paid for? That's included in the um, estimated costs. So they are included, and it, that is on the water side. Okay. Uh, at what point will the availability of uh, SRF, State Revolving Fund financing, be known? Yeah, that's going to take a little while. I mean, right now you're, you're working to get your WIFI application, which is just due in the next couple of weeks. Um, the state revolving fund loan won't, you know, commit to anything until they've you've finished their application for them, which you have to do some stuff to get to that stage. They have a large, you know, a lot of the time they need to do is there's environmental clearances that have to take place, both from WIFIA and SRF, and it's some of the same federal environmental clearances you need to get, so those could happen in parallel. So it's going to be some time before you find out if you had a funding commitment from SRF. It could be... I. I I don't know if they've told you, a year or 18 months? 18 months. Um, um, really, it ranges between 6 and 18 months, depending on their in, any workload. We're thinking the 18 months is probably realistic. Also, they require a um, funding stream to as part of their application, so we need to have rates in place that could retire an SRF loan before we can actually apply. Is, is the interest rate on the state revolving fund loans, is that, does that float or is it fixed during it does, this period of time? Yeah, it does float. It's based on half, approximately half of the state's most recent general obligation bond. So the last time the state issued, rates were very low. So the uh, state revolving fund loans currently have a rate of about 1.8%. But once the state issues again, you know, it'll probably tick up a little bit. So we assumed 2.2% in our projections slightly higher but still very what's, good what's going to drive what's going to drive the the interest rate on that is it is is it based on some index or some mar mar are market forces going to impact that to to cause it to go up yeah market forces i mean we're coming out of a period of a very low interest rates for a number of years they bumped up around you know january but they're still quite low but yeah it's it's just the market forces in general I mean, the state is a very good credit, but still, as the rate, you know, as general interest rates rise and, and fall, so does California's rate. And what we're looking at, the, you know, when you do these long-term financings, the short-term rate doesn't matter so much, you know, whether the short-term rate goes up and down. It's really the long-term rate. So that really what drives a lot of the, the increase in cost is if the long-term rate goes up. It's hard to guess what's going to happen with that, other than to say we're currently in a low environment, historically very low. so. Odds are, in the future, the more likely rates would be higher than lower. On revenue bonds, uh, revenue mini bonds, which I assume this is what the, the, you're in the mini bond market, um, what are the terms, the, the loan terms available? You, said, you mentioned 30 years. Is it possible to get a longer loan term? And how does that affect the interest rate and the uh, principal and interest repayment? Yeah, interestingly, um, for the WIFIA, it doesn't matter that much because the WIFIA rates are based on some rates called state and local government security rate that's uh, published by the U.S. Treasury Department. And those rates, when you get out of, past a certain range, it's pretty flat. So they're just kind of picking a certain rate. So it, whether you go 30, 35 years with WIFIA, I think it's going to be just about exactly the same rate. Bonds are a little different. Um, 
because you're going to, you know, bonds, you have principal payments coming due each year, and the, the, the two-year rate's a lot lower than the, or a little bit lower than the 10-year rate, which is lower than the 30-year rate. Um, so bonds, can you go out longer than 30 years? Sure, there's an agency that went out with 100-year bonds a few years ago to do some massive things. That's a real rarity. Typically, uh, agencies don't like to go out more than 30 years, although on rare occasion they have. But when you go out longer term, you're putting more principal in the, in the longer term, which is where the higher interest rates are. So for the bonds, the longer term you go, the higher average interest rate you're going to end up with. Okay. And, um... and SRF, I'll just mention, they only go out 30 years max. As far as the, the issue about putting the, the, the uh, surcharge on the utility bill or putting it on the, the property tax rolls, um, is there any data on how many utility customers or property owners w might qualify for low income assistance? In the analysis that was done in 2015, there were somewhat over 900 um, residents in Morro Bay that would qualify. We have about 128 um, currently enrolled in the program. Now, are the but those are is that 900 a blend of renters and property owners, or is it? I would assume owners? so. Yes. Okay, so we don't have any firm data on how many property owners. No, and I doubt if we can get that information. PG&E will not give us discrete um, information. They only give us uh, the gross numbers. And the reason I'm asking this question is because of the concern of putting it on the property tax roll and that taking away the availability of low-income assistance for property owners as opposed to putting it on the utility bill. So if, we, if it goes on the property tax rolls and it's the utility discount will impact the surcharge, it's going to be a matter of timing because we have to go um, before the council every year and adopt the... Um, assessment, if you will, on the tax roll. Um, that's due to the county by early August. Um, the enrollment period for the utility discount is July, we have, so we won't know who's enrolled until the end of July. So I think we're going to have to work through kind of a rebate program if that's what the option um, or recommendation is. And, and at some point, maybe later in the second half of the fifth calendar year, we'd have to have people come in and get a rebate if it's on the um, on the property tax rolls. That's the only right, way right now I can think of that it would work, because it, it won't work to give a discount when we have to submit the charges to the county. But a rebate it to low-income property owners is an option? I think we could make that work. I, I mean, we haven't worked through the details of that, but that would be the track that we would go down from okay. a timing perspective. Okay, and, and then... Um, is there any data on uh, the cost, collection cost, current collection cost for delinquent bills? We have about 8% delinquency was the, la the last time I looked. Okay. How are those delinquent, delinquent uh, payments collected? We make um, three or four attempts in-house to do that, and then we send them to collections. Do you have any idea how, how many uh, the percentage actually goes to collections? Um, I don't have that off the top of my okay. head. I'll, I'll look that up for you. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's all. Don. Above. Um, it's my understanding that there's some there's some charge from the county if you do the property tax rolls. There is, unfortunately, and I heard it was uh, somewhere around two dollars per per bill. And so how is, parcel. can you just, yeah. Just to clarify, $2 per year per parcel. Per year per parcel. And so that goes to the rate payer. How is that? Is that, um, a, is that a fee that the city absorbs, $2 per year per parcel? And how many parcels, like what would that look yeah, like? Diff different agencies do it different ways, but there certainly are a lot of agencies that add that as a separate charge line item for the, the customer if it goes on the property tax roll. So... That's a good point. If you did the property tax route, there probably would be a, a $2 increase per month. No, no, no 17 oh, cents oh, a month. Oh, it was $2 month. per year, I mean, sorry. <laughs> $2 per year increase on the bill. Do we know how many parcels that would represent if the city didn't put it that You know what I mean? If the city had to, uh, ended up 
absorbing that? 5,600. Roughly 5,600 parcels. So $11,000 a year? Yes. Okay. Anything else? Walter? Thank you. Um, one question, I'm just wondering if there's any data available uh, with regard to the utility discount program. Uh, how much money is in that fund and how much are, is being used roughly currently? Um, I th believe the fund has a, a, f a fund balance of $320,000. Um, we, I think, are on track to expend about 40000 this year with the number of enrollees that we currently have. Um, the, the council just adopted um, some guidelines for the utility discount program, setting that at 10 percent, and we are making um, efforts at trying to get notification out. We're going to have an insert in this bill that goes out in July, because um, that's the only enrollment period, um, to, to let people know that they can enroll in that. But there's there's sufficient fund balance in there right now to, you know, if everybody qualified, it might be a little short if all 928 um, participated, but, um, or 956 participated, but um, we have a, a decent fund balance accrued right now. Thank you. That, that's all I have. Jesse? Paul? I don't have any uh, questions on the presentation, but I do have some questions on the Blue Ribbon Committee report, and I'd like to save those till after we hear from the public. Okay, we will come back for that. Sure. Val? Um, <clears throat> is it fair to say that we're likely to see additional cost savings as the design, design build team, uh, we have continued negotiations? Um, should we get the SRF loan and should we get grants and how would that um, maybe um, cause take the place of the more expensive uh, bond monies or would it? So these um, rate analysis were, were based on information that we have right now. Um, as we negotiate with the preferred contractor, um, we do have a guaranteed maximum price. We expect to hold that and hopefully negotiate that down. Also, there are, through the contract itself, there are incentives for to uh, finish early and for less than their guaranteed maximum price. So um, we're working to reduce that cost. Um, as those costs come down, how they should the community support uh, a proposed rate increase and the council pass that on the rates will be reviewed on an annual basis so that uh, council doesn't need to impose that maximum rate if the costs come in lower than what we anticipate in the rate increase and the same applies on the financing side now uh, when you saw my numbers, the bonds weren't a big part of it. Maybe they were, you know, 20, 25 million out of, you know, 120 plus million dollar project. But certainly, if you were to get state revolving fund loans, if you were to get grants, anything like that, that would reduce the amount you need to pay each year in the future. Now, even with low rate loans, it doesn't mean just because the interest rate's half, doesn't mean the payment's half, because a big part of the payment is repaying that principal. Um, but it does come down a bit. And it would definitely save money in the long run. And when we ran a, the scenario, assuming if you got long-term state revolving fund loan financing instead of the bond financing, it brought down the monthly charge by about seven dollars. And grants would take it down even further. Val, anything else? Thank you. Um, I just have two uh, questions related to the presentation, Alex. Um, on the property tax issue, and based on your experience working with other cities and agencies, have you seen any innovative programs whereby a property owner who may not qualify for the discount uh, but would want a deferral, pro, uh, deferral process for that $41 surtax into the future or perhaps when the property sells because they feel it's still a burden? 
Yeah, that's a good question. I'm not familiar with any agency in California that has that, but I, I grew up mostly in Connecticut, and I'm remembering there was a hearing about a program there um, where if the property, if, if there was a, a senior and a, a fixed income in the home and the property value went up and drove up their property taxes and they couldn't afford it, they could apply to not have to pay the difference in property taxes and instead that amount would be kept as a lien against their property so that when it did change hands or get sold, the city would get their, their funds back and be made whole. Meanwhile, the, the individual in the property, they're, they're, you know, they're not forced out of their home. Okay. And also, based on your experience, is there any anecdotal uh, evidence in terms of completion of a major infrastructure project that tends to benefit the property owners, maybe more so than the rate payers in this case, or is that? Um, I, you know, anytime you have uh, safe, reliable facilities, that I mean, it benefits the property values in an area. Uh, mm -hmm. We've worked with some agencies that, I mean, their, their water and sewer is awful, and you know, people don't want to live there, or they have to do so much. And you know, the other side of the coin is the higher the cost, maybe that impacts things. But we're talking about, you know, here I don't know if that would have any. Mm -hmm. the, the cost of the uh, the charges would have any impact on the property values. But certainly, you're building this facility to serve this community, and all the property owners in the community benefit from that. Okay, thank you. And my final question is, you mentioned there's a report with more tables on some of the scenarios. Is uh, that the financial analysis yeah. report, and where can that be yeah, found? Yeah, so we're, we're planning on taking input uh, to help clarify, see if there's any needed clarification, and issue the report tomorrow, probably towards the end of the okay. day. Okay, it'll be on the city website, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. That, that's all I had. Um, public comment? All right, we'd like to open it up. We still may have more questions later, uh, but we'd like to open it up now for public comment. If you would come up, state your name, and perhaps confine your comments, if you can, to three minutes. Do you have a, uh, okay, so, and is there, do you want them to sign in as they come up? Okay, okay. So, uh, public comment, if you'd come up to the uh, speaker stand, uh, we'd like to hear your public comment. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Eric Four, a Morro Bay citizen. Um, I'd like to speak to the inequity of the inflation effect that um, our city is forcing on the entire community. Inflation is something that we're all familiar with. And uh, when it happens, and if we're fortunate enough, uh, we can pass on the expense to us. In this situation, many of us cannot pass this on, but some of us can. Commercial interests and landlords will pass this added expense on. This is a whole segment of the Morro Bay community that will be very pro um, this project, no matter what the cost because they'll just pass it on. Myself and many of us, particularly myself, am seriously considering moving. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Anyone else for public comment? Please come forward, thank you. Hey, uh, good afternoon, Kerrigan Mahan, Morro Bay citizen. Um, I just want to comment to um, some of the specifics that came up here. Um, as far as the recycling goes, uh, you know, I, I, I can't be the only one uh, reading and seeing that technology is moving at a very rapid rate and we have a new potable system and all we have to do is talk to Pismo Beach. They just, they're just down the road a couple of miles. Uh, we're premature with the recycling, I believe. I think it's silly. I think it should be pulled off the table completely. Um, 
I, I honestly, I think the whole, I've said this for over a year, I think the whole project is completely out of control. I, I think we're, um, we're all um, dealing deep in the weeds uh, with, with all due respect to your figures and your presentation, sir. Um, boy, it's a, it's a lot of numbers and they're all way, way, way too big for a town of 10,000 people. Um, everything about the project, I think, is wrong. I've said this for a year. I think it's way, way too big. Um, <clears throat> sir, on the end, I didn't... Uh, Stuart, I guess. You spoke about uh, um, uh, plants that can be um, made, uh, constructed. Uh, perk, 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 perk. Let's look into the history of perk. They've been on board for a long time. I'm gonna call them myself. I already have a call into them. I spoke to another one about 10 months ago. Um, they can do this for 50, 60 million dollars all in. We don't seem to have any uh, desire to pursue that. I'm not sure what that's about. I've been questioning motive for over a year. Um, anyway, that, uh, that none of that has been properly disclosed, and it's all on record uh, as to what Perk's involvement has been uh, regarding our project, and they wanted to bid, but then we set the requirements at $89 million times two that they had to have done uh, in the past, a project of that size. So this is all very, <clears throat> there's a lot of, lot of stuff that isn't being discussed or disclosed. Um, the five-year thing with regards to the 215, 218, I'm, I'm just a little confused. It seems like we've lost a year here. We're going to start, we're going to start uh, charging in 2019, and that's four years. I was under the impression we, we, we that's that's supposed to be five years before we, before we bump up our rates. Um, <clears throat> respectful of what you said. Um, Sir, regarding uh, other plants uh, in California costing, I quote, uh, half a billion dollars, in some cases maybe a billion dollar facility, I, 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 can't, I, I don't believe that there's any place in California, maybe a monster city. Um, I want to comment to the WIFI application. I think it's full of fraudulent misnomers, the application itself. I'm sorry, your time is running Oh, are out. we holding to three minutes? Oh, okay. Yes. <clears throat> okay, finally, the guaranteed rate, maximum rate. I think it's ridiculous that we continue to discuss a, max, a guaranteed maximum rate when we continue to change the number on literally now it's becoming on a daily basis, the number changes. So I think it's interesting that we can guarantee whatever number happens to be the popular number. Anyway. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. I'm Carol Truesdale. Been here since 1995, and thank you everybody for attending, including the audience. One of the things that concerns me about this is that the city does have uh, financial issues moving forward, and talk is out there that perhaps the sales tax may need to be generated to, in order for them to take care of some of the CalPERS loans and things like that. It hasn't been set on the table, but I even recommended it at a, at a council meeting. So before we add any more issues to our citizens that are going to have to cough up more money, please, please really think of how it's going to affect every family because this is not just going to be $41 surcharge. And if everybody believes that, then I live in la-la land. So thank you very much. Thank you, Carol. Welcome, Barry. Good afternoon, Barry Brannon. First, I want to thank every one of you. It's uh, terrific that the, our citizens are so proactive, and, and I, don't, I don't, couldn't write enough thank you notes just to even think about this project. The other thing I wanted to say is that the the TRIB on the 21st had a, a list of the new water rates for City of San Luis Obispo, and their water and sewer rates for five units, it was in the TRIB, was $108 a month. So 
understand that we have a unique problem here, but $108 a month should be the target. Um, 191, I'm sorry, that's, that doesn't ring my bell. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, members of uh, P. Webb, I believe, and the uh, C and the Citizens Finance Advisory Council, and the Water Reclamation Facility Citizens Advisory Committee. My name is Aaron Oaks of Save Morro Bay, and uh, I just have a couple of remarks. Um, based on the presentation, which I thought was informative, there's a lot of uh, speculation. There's a lot of guesstimates uh, going into the Proposition 218 process. Uh, according to the California Constitution that we need to have more finite cost um, assigned. In 2015, uh, the city of Morro Bay talked about having a guaranteed maximum rate. And uh, what we learned at the workshop on Saturday was a lot of that was pie in the sky, conceptual estimates. And going forward, when we have a Proposition 218 vote, we need to be more certain of the cost, especially when it comes to the duration of payments. Um, I noticed that it's, it's gonna be $191 a month for a couple of years according to sort of the, the, the base plan, um, which seems to be the direction that the city is going. But I don't know how that $191 a month can be guaranteed for the next several years. Uh, according to Joseph Pannoni at the uh, joint workshop on Saturday, he told a couple of residents that there would likely be another Proposition 218 vote within the next few years. And so we keep talking about that this rate, that, that we're married to this rate and we shouldn't be. Uh, it's it's going to keep evolving. It's going to keep increasing. And given the escalation of costs that we've seen since 2015, it, it's a problem. So it's just going to start at 191. And, and I don't have a lot of confidence that we're focusing on the cost controls of keeping the cost down and uh, while looking at further grant opportunities on the federal and state level. I know uh, city council and staff members went to Washington, D.C. back in February uh, to meet with our congressional representatives, and, which, and I deeply appreciate that, but I think we need to have a, a, a larger conversation about how we can subsidize some of these costs through grant funding. Um, and I thought that was conspicuously absent from the presentation. Uh, we've talked about WIFIA. We haven't been awarded that yet. SRF, according to the Blue Ribbon uh, Committee report, that we haven't been invited to participate in that yet for the SRF. And there's just a lot of variables. And as someone who's getting myself familiar with the budgetary process here with the city, I'm kind of concerned that we're going on with a lot of speculation with no guarantee of final cost. Thank you. Hold on a second. We're have an AV uh, challenge. Musical interlude. Gene will do the timing. You're fired. Steve Stevens. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Steve Stevens. I'm primarily um, concerned, again, about uh, all these open-ended uh, questions that I still hear out there about the viability, uh, especially relative to injection wells. Uh, there are... No problem. No problem. Um, there are uh, a number of other questions that that um, I also hear are open-ended. Uh, I think, at the very least, uh, we ought to respect the recommendations. Uh, uh, although I don't concur with all of the conclusions of the Blue Ribbon Commissions, uh, respect their recommendation in terms of. Um, at least deferring the decision for another month and perhaps getting some of these questions uh, answered. I, I think it's really beneficial um, and, and would, would uh, uh, help just um, a lot of people that um, 
that are still on the fence on this. Um, and then lastly, I, I, I keep going back to this, uh, and um, but that's pertaining to the um, city fact sheet that, that um, uh, they came out in 2015, and respectfully, uh, on that sheet, it talked in terms of, and I, I won't read again because it, my time probably won't allow it, but uh, that the city of Morro Bay did have adequate funding to, to proceed with the project, um, and a viable project, and that would have been within that uh, $75 million uh, range. So I appreciate uh, the time. Thanks so much. And thank you. Thank you for your music, Walt. <laughs> Is there anybody else for uh, public comment? Um, I'm Sharon O'Leary from the Community Resource Connections Office. It's a city service. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, response uh, from the community about the uh, water and sewer costs. Um, I also uh, went to PG&E and Department of Social Services asking for the numbers of persons in Morro Bay that uh, are on uh, programs that w so we could do some kind of uh, direct mailing perhaps. Uh, but I also could not get those uh, figures because uh, it's confidential information. But in looking at other data like the uh, poverty maps which were produced by Cal Poly and Food Bank Coalition, we can see that about 3,500 people in Morro Bay fit into one of the three levels of poverty. So I'm thinking that probably the CARE program, which is a PG&E program, is using the federal level of poverty, which doesn't really address the other levels of poverty in our um, community, which are the state level and the United Way uh, real cost measure. So again, thinking about the, um, the um, water discount program, um, I understand that it's going to be open for just the one month. Uh, the CARE program is available for application um, all year round. So I called over to the city to see why it was available and open for just one month. It seemed to be a staff. Uh, or a budget uh, situation. So our office perhaps can help with um, a pre-app uh, help with uh, getting those applications in. That might be helpful. But I would hope that the city would keep the um, water discount program open year, year round eventually and continue to grow the uh, funding for that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Jennifer, did you catch that? Okay, thank you. Is there anybody else for a public comment? Okay, seeing none, I'll close public comment and turn it over to staff if you want to respond with any additional comments or the questions that have been raised that were not related to the clarifying questions. Okay, I think there was a couple that were in my domain. Some of them sound like they have to do with the project. Um, I can't answer anything about that or what the alternatives are. Although I was at the community forum on Saturday and I learned a lot about the project and how this plant, when you really add it up, sound like it's not that much difference in unit cost than the Cayucos plant. They're just a lot smaller facility. I'll, but I, I, and that was the, the project manager who was uh, talking about that. But some of the things that came out, I think, in, in my domain were um, one, someone mentioned the rates in San Luis Obispo were lower, and certainly there's a lot of communities that have lower rates than you do now, and there's other communities I work with that have higher rates. San Luis Obispo is inland, they're not on the coast, they're not subject to the same regulatory requirements, and they've got a lot bigger customer base for allocating their fixed costs, for example, than a small community uh, like here, and they have much, uh, well, so what we, what's important at the end of the day to me, when I see one agency's got rates that are higher than another or lower than another, I found very little correlation with, you know, how efficiently or well the agencies operated. Some agencies have high rates just due to the reality of their situations, and unfortunately, 
it sounds like this is one of them. You've got a small community and, and a big project that's, uh, that has a pretty big impact. But even the rates I'm seeing here, where at the end of the, you know, at the end of five years, or whenever the, the charge is fully phased in, I work with other agencies who've got a sewer charge that's over 200 month, months you know, per month alone. Um, so at the end of the day, every agency's got to fund its own, its own needs. The other thing was, th there are you know guesstimates and speculation. And I agree, there are certainly estimates that are put in this because no one has a crystal ball what's going to happen with your cost down the line. But I, we've done this for many, many agencies. We did this five years uh, in 2015 for the city. And you could have said the same thing back then. We looked at the numbers uh, to compare. We saw it was almost spot on on the water side. So you use good estimates. You look to the future. You build in reasonable assumptions based on professional engineering assessments. Uh, yeah, you know, build in reasonable cost inflation, and then you, you move the rates in the right direction, and you always have the ability to go back and reevaluate because no one knows what, exactly what your water use is going to be in four years down the line, uh, or what interest rates are going to be in two and a half years down the line. So there's always a little bit of speculation there, but I think that's only at the margins. If you made a little more conservative assumptions, maybe the rates are a little more this way, a little more that way, but they're going to be in that same ballpark. I think the assumptions we used in here are pretty are pretty good assumptions. They're not overly generous by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and it did look like the rates, when we ran the finances, would be good for the next five years, hopefully more. Part of it is when this debt service hits, it's a fixed charge each year. It's not a charge that's going to keep escalating, so you're going to have a big chunk of your uh, costs are going to remain the same for a long period of time, meaning they're de decreasing in inflationary terms. And also, yeah, there are yeah, the other thing, you know, certainly not every agency is facing a $500 million or billion dollar treatment plan improvement, but I, I am working with a couple of other agencies right now that they originally had, you know, $350 million cost estimate. Well, now they're at the 800 million range now that they've really got into the project for rebuilding a treatment plant in their influent force main. San Mateo's got to rebuild its plant. There's about a 500 million right there, plus their collection system. But I think what I want to point out is the principle. That there's a lot of infrastructure in California was put in, you know, 30, a lot of treatment plants went in the 70s. Yours went in the 1950s originally. It's just old. It's not up to modern day regulatory standards. The, the regional board keeps getting stricter and stricter with what they make agencies. So a lot of these treatment plans don't even meet the current regulations. They give them a certain amount of time to, 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 to get their act and do whatever facilities they need to do. But all up and down California, there's kind of an infrastructure crisis. A lot of things that the, they're just, they're old, they're worn out, and they need to be rebuilt. And a lot of agencies have been trying to plan for it in their rates, generating funding for your, your capital program, or unfortunately, a lot of agencies now are looking at, you know, replacing or doing major upgrades to their, their treatment plants. Thank you, Alex. I got, got it. So there was a couple questions um, regarding um, comparative to perhaps another vendor that we might go to. Um, a company called Perk sent us a letter um, at the end of the RFP process. Um, looking at their costs and comparing to what was proposed, um, they proposed a um, on-site wastewater treatment plant of about $56.2 million in that letter. Um, and we'll provide uh, uh, these detailed costs in um, a report that will be going out probably to council or a supplement to that. Um, their total project costs for secondary um, Title 22 treatment plant was $105 million. Um, our phase project, if we, the kind of the fictional project that if we were to build only a uh, plant that would discharge to the ocean based on the numbers that we've received so far is $105 million. If you used um, Perks numbers for their water reuse project, it comes in at $135.9 million versus the estimates and the bids that we have, um, or proposed guaranteed maximum price of $125.9 million. So, um, you know, they had they didn't have the benefit of going through a full design in their um, estimates. Um, so, 
but it's still about $10 million for the full project, more than what we have in our budgetary costs. Um, regarding um, what's happening down the road in Pismo, um, actually, I visited their plant and had an opportunity to drink that water um, right off the um, um, RO membranes after uh, advanced treatment. And um, they ultimately will be doing the same thing that we're proposing to do. They'll be injecting that water into the upper Santa Maria groundwater basin and withdrawing it through their extraction wells um, for use in their system, which is exactly what we're proposing, um, except in the Moro Basin. Um, let me look at a couple more questions here. I think Alex actually handled uh, most of the rest of the questions, um, but I'm sure there'll be more follow-up from these boards and be happy to try to answer those. I'll turn it over to Scott. I think maybe just one. Uh, there was a question about waiting until August for bringing forward the rates uh, as identified by the Blue Ribbon Commission in their report and recommendations. Uh, that was based on the, the knowledge that we're working will be working or probably already started the work in negotiations with the preferred proposer, Black and Beach Filong. Um, we can't complete those negotiations until we have rates secured. So um, while in a month we may be able to get more information, we will, really won't have those, those numbers sorted until after rates are adopted because they will not enter into a contract and we can't enter into a contract until we have the rates secured. That's and the environmental document. Um, the, the broader point, I think, uh, raised by BRC and, and the, the folks who have mentioned, you know, spoken today is just, you know, there's some information that we could, we can gain if we only wait. If we only wait a little bit longer, we'll get more information. That's absolutely true. The backstop is city council being able to look at the rates, both the revenue, I'm looking at the whole picture every year, the revenue generated, the costs, any new information like SRF being received or grant being received, cost reductions garnered through the GSI study that will look at injection wells at proper location, how much capacity it has that may lead to changes at the facility and, and downsizing the ultimate size and scope of the project. If those cost savings are identified, that is information that council will look at very closely every year to see if they can adjust that surcharge down. It won't go above 191. Um, the other thing is that the more we wait, the more we see cost escalations on the project. Uh, right now, we're basing about a three to 4% increase on uh, this facility. That's just a, a typical interest rate or cost of living, basically. But uh, in some recent research, we're seeing that maybe that's 50 to 60% cost escalations on wastewater projects are even higher. I think Rob just saw a report last week, which is staggering because we have basically zero, zero unemployment. Uh, the economy is at an all-time high in a lot of respects. There's a lot of cities, as Alex mentioned, that need infrastructure improvements, and there's only so many contractors out there that can do the job. And so the, the more we delay, the more we can expect those costs to increase. And we still have the time schedule order from the Regional Water Quality Control Board that states we need to follow a schedule uh, in terms of when rates are adopted, when you know uh, design is complete, when construction begins, when construction is completed, when that project goes online, ultimately within five years meeting the uh, Water Quality Act, the guidelines that were, were based on uh, what wastewater effluent into the ocean is based upon. If we don't hit those, we can expect uh, anywhere from a thousand dollar fine up to ten thousand or eleven thousand dollar fine a day that could be levied against the city so those are considerations we often need to take into place when thinking about timing of this project it's always going to feel rushed especially when you're talking about your own personal finances and we we really understand that and that's why we spent a great amount of time in those two months of really looking at combing over those the details of the um, rate study with Alex with the Blue Ribbon Commission um, to make sure we weren't missing something. And yes, the numbers have come down a bit, and I, I don't think that's a bad thing. Thank you. Uh, Rick, do we have more comments, questions, discussion? 
Anyone down here for, um, start with you, Stu, again? Work our way down? Well, I guess we'll try it here. And the, uh, I went through the brochure, this critter here, and made some notes on it. And I don't know if you've got this. That's the one yeah. that Jen delivered the other night. Uh, just some questions on page seven. Uh, the graph at the top of the page shows that we have 60 million in cash on hand, if I interpret that right, and 17 million for the sewer. Is that true? It's page seven. Sorry. I'm sorry, what document are you referring to? It's this page here. Yeah. Okay, thank Today's you. Today's agenda packet. So, yeah, I think your numbers are pretty close there with cash on hand, and that's assuming um, we should have added the actual figures in there, so sorry about that, but that's assuming um, that we kind of go with that front-loaded model and we start accumulating cash early on in the project to pay for more pay-go as we go along and reduce the amount that we finance. So all of that, um, Alex is going to put his chart up there. Um, but this is the chart that's on the screen behind you. It's kind of a pie chart of that same, that same graph. So there's going to be 20, almost 23 million in the sewer. Um, just under five million in water cash, and the rest through the loans and the bond financing. You, you don't right, have, right. Yes. It's not cash on hand at the moment. It's cash we're going to be getting throughout the project. No, it's not. Okay, I, I see that. I, the, uh, and one thing I just want to mention with, with water and sewer rates, just so folks are clear, you know, any because I think there were some comments in the community forum too. Hey, we thought you <clears> paid for some of these projects, but you didn't use the money. Um, that often happens with water and sewer agencies. You know, the people are funding something, but it takes time to design and build them. But every dollar that goes to water stays with the water. Every dollar that goes to sewer is legally mandated to stay in sewer. So there is no, all the money from the utilities stays with the utilities. Thank you. Uh, on page 15, there are four uh, numbers at the top. Projects that they have not completed could have immediate adverse effects on the health and safety of the community and must be completed. That means we have an urgency in getting this done in the next five years because why? So those are the most critical um, CIP projects outside of um, the WERF project. And um, we have those identified on both the um, um, water side and the wastewater side. Um, so on the um, wastewater side, there are projects to deal with I and I or inflow um, and infiltration. So stormwater getting into the system. Um, so they include, you know, the Main Street line, the Tascadero Road line, plus. Um, um, pipelines are in, that are in the ground upstream of lift station one, which nobody knows where it is, um, which is at the Cloisters project. It's those beach tracked homes with fairly shallow um, sewer lines um, that have, that's our, one of our main sources of water getting into the system. So those, we have capital project identified every year um, to basically address those lines. On the water side, um, some of the critical um, um, items that we need to fund are based on maintaining fire flow in the system and complying with current fire flow demands, um, include replacement of the um, nutmeg tank, um, which we've been carrying as a CIP for a number of years. Um, also, um, a new fill line for the Blanca tanks. Those are the most northerly um, tanks in the city off of Blanca, there's four. Um, water storage tanks that would replace a, a booster pump station that exists on Vashon Street that is um, um, too small, physically too small to work in, and um, is in the side yard of a residence. So um, they get to listen to every time those pumps come on or a valve opens or closes. Um, 
Additionally, there's some um, pipeline improvements that need to be made to maintain um, fire flow. Um, um, those, are, those are the critical infrastructures that we've identified in the first five years. So um, as it was presented in the rate study, um, something around $1 million a year um, in sewer capital and about $1.3 million a year in water capital improvement needs. Thank you, Rob. Uh, the next question is projects that are absolute, absolutely needed to ensure an adequate water supply. Uh, we have a desal plant, don't we? Is, we have do we have used, a de We've used that in the past to get an adequate water supply when the state didn't provide us, and that's an ocean out there. We, we haven't used the ocean um, side of the desal plant um, since the 90s. Um, we use the brackish water RO side of the desal plant. So we um, use it for removal of nitrate from our um, wells that are in the lower Moro Valley. That desal plant was built as an emergency project in the 90s um, and um, needs some uh, critical improvements, electrical and replacement of the pressure vessels for it to operate securely. Do, do you see us abandoning the, the desal plant? Um, I see us, if we need to do major upgrades per our coastal permit, we might be looking for a new site for that desal plant. Hmm. Okay, there's been some talk about... Yeah, that, and that's the reason why, um, as will be discussed in the One Water planning effort that's going to council on Tuesday, why the injection wells are um, the most likely benefit to our water supply. Okay. I remember a couple of years ago when we were running out of water and a, uh, we were, the state water project didn't have any water for us and we, were, we got 5% of our allocation or maybe less than that. Uh, we we're banking water in the San Luis Reservoir, is that right? So. Um, we have an allocation for 1,313 acre feet a year of water. Um, due to conservation, we use less than our allocation. So anything less than our allocation gets stored um, in the system at San Luis Reservoir. It's stored there until the system spills. So in a wet year, um, which happened last year, um, the system spilled. Not literally, it didn't, there was no spill over the dam at San Luis Reservoir. It went out, the delta, um, and uh, that, all that stored water for those agencies that store in the per contract is reset to zero. Um, so um, the stored water we have there now is uh, uh, somewhere around 200 acre feet because of the difference between what we're using this year and our allocation for this year. Okay, so you have to go a few years of drought before, and we have to contribute whatever we can contribute to build up a reserve in San Luis water. Yes, the worst, worst case scenario for that storage scenario is a, a wet year followed by drought. So if there's a wet year followed by lower than normal allocations, um, we don't have that stored water to rely, rely upon. On page 29, it talks about a uh, $16,000 per month for electricity at the new plant to run the new right. facility. I would imagine that's the total thing. Does that include the pumps and the, and the rest of the things that uh, are attached to it to bring the water to the new plant? I believe it does. Good, good. And we could perhaps augment that with some solar out there or maybe some wind turbines to help defer the cost, which would drastically lower our water bills. Is that I think, I think we ha have some um, um, site planning area for set aside for solar, whether we do that with a purchase power agreement or we build it ourselves, uh, um, that's down the road. I don't know if it would result in significant rate savings because of the, um, much of the rate is driven by debt service, not by um, operational costs. Alex is going to correct me if I'm wrong. No, you're exactly right. I mean, that's what we see with some of these solar facilities. Not all the, all the, the case, but, you know, you have to buy them. You have to pay for them. So you've got a payment and you're saving electricity. So sometimes they try to match that up. So the benefit for some agencies really doesn't happen. They make it a little benefit in the near term, but it's really in the long term after they've paid the facility off. 
yet the facility is still operating electricity, that's when they generate the, the, the you know, the cheap yeah. electricity because there's no more debt service payments going out for it. Uh, we could also store electricity kinetically. You know, we could store it in batteries or we could store it in an inclined plane or various other things to save electricity that we generate that's excess. And uh, it seems to be like that's, that would be a, a no-brainer in this scenario. And that's all I have. Next. Okay. Okay. Uh, in this report, you talked about two ways of funding, funding either the monthly payment or putting it on the tax bill. Is it possible for people to have a choice in which kind they wanted, or does everybody have to be on the same one? That's a good question. Um, I will defer to the city. I think that's more of an administrative decision. I don't think there's any legal requirement that says you can't do it one way or the, or the other. So there's nothing legally preventing you from doing something like that. But I, I've never seen an agency do that. But you could. I don't know that there's a restriction from the county. I think we'd really have to think through the administrative aspect of that, right? Because we have to submit the, the APN numbers that it would be on the rules. So we'd have to have somebody reaffirm that every year. Um, we probably could think through that if that's the direction you'd like to provide, but I can see it being a, an administrative hassle issue. On the, on the base case versus the phased in case, is the, the benefit to the city, is it the fact that just get more cash reserves ahead of time by going the, the base case? Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, if you, if you charge the full surcharge, not next year, but starting a year down the line, um, you're going to be generating that full surcharge of revenues, which is giving you more cash, 4.3 million more to put towards the project. So it's 4.3 million less of bonds or whatever else you need to finance out there. So that's what the difference is. It's pay more now um, and have a lower debt service stream and a little, little bit lower rates in the future. Is that basically the only benefit of going one versus the other? Yeah, and th this is just based on the scenarios we used here. I mean, there could be other phase-ins. There could be a phase-in that's a little bit more aggressive than what we showed that maybe got you, you know, maybe it kept $292 instead of 191 but still had some phase and component to it. And we're certainly happy to uh, run some other numbers. I mean, there's, there's, there's no single correct way to come up with these numbers. So kind of working with the staff and commission, we have a few alternatives, but it's easy to, to look at more. Okay. And then on the, uh, I noticed that one of the ways we cut down on the cost of the overall cost of the sewer was to remove the existing site from the equation as to what's the decommissioning of that. Um, obviously, it involves Cayucas as well. But at some point, whatever happens to that site, is it something that gets tied to the sewer as well? So any funds that possibly would be generated from that site would go back towards the overall sewer costs? Um, so the, the site was funded using um, sewer funds, so any um, sale of that property would need to reimburse the sewer fund before anything else. Um, so yes, it could um, offset those costs. Um, the reason the demolition was taken out is um, it will happen at the very end of the project, five years down the road. We do have, it is an additive alternative, so we can use um, the guaranteed maximum price from the contractor, or we can bid that out separately to see if there's local contracting interest and perhaps get a better price on that. Um, also, um, the Blue Ribbon Commission felt that it was, it was good to remove that from the, the costs because of um, being conservative in other areas. Um, um, should those cost savings be incurred, that can be added in without any impact to the rates. And is, is there any discussion about what the future idea will be? I mean, you mentioned sale of the site, but is it something that can be held on to as a long-term lease site, similar to the Embarcadero sites? Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. Go yeah, ahead. That's okay. Yeah, the, there has been lots of discussion, right, thoughts about it. Um, most recently, City Council this year said, you know, let's make that a priority for next year to really kind of evaluate our options. Um, 
any number of things could occur there. We, you know, some folks have talked about a hotel, some people have talked about a park, some people have talked about a wetlands there, um, any variety of uses. Uh, part of the issue why, why we are not ready to proceed in, in putting this into the, the rate calculations that there's a lot of work to do with Cayucas, yeah. um, as well as trying to sort kind of out what's the best use for uh, the, that property moving forward. And uh, as I've said before, I mean, we expect a pretty robust community outreach on that because it is a, a pretty prime location and uh, certainly could be put to better use than its current use. On that same subject with the uh, decommissioning, um, the, uh, the plant itself is split between Morro Bay and Cayucas. Is the property um, also split, or is that all Morro Bay? Yes, they have ownership of, of uh, the property. Of the actual property, so yep. whatever decision on the use or disposal of the property will be yeah, in that's, conjunction with it's the all The negotiation would factor in all those components. Okay. Um, back on the 2015-218 uh, um, measure, um, that was based on, at that time, doing a plant in the Morrow Valley. Is that right? Before we were forced to go over to um, the Choro Valley and change the locations? That was based on um, a pre-facilities master plan, concept design for a uh, treatment plant on the Rancho Colina site, if we all remember that. Uh, that the Rancho Colina site, uh, the mobile home park east of town on Highway 41, the front part of that. Um, so that was based on a pre-facilities master plan uh, cost estimate, looking at a secondary only treatment plant on that site for uh, approximately $75 million, of which Morro Bay share would be $56.2 million, I believe. Okay. So that was a major escalation in the cost of the plant, and with the uh, additional lift stations was um, the current siting, correct? Yeah. Plus going that, through the um, preliminary design through the facilities master planning, which we didn't have that benefit of doing, okay. having that information at that time. No, I know there's been a lot of concern that, okay, these rates, we say these are the rates that we're going to have for the next five years, um, but since we're already uh, jumping, uh, you know, reallocating or redoing another 218 prior to the end of the five-year span, they're saying, well, the city's going to come back and, you know, in three years, what's going to stop them from coming and asking for more money on a 218 again? Um, that n nothing is guaranteed. And I realize nothing is guaranteed, none of these estimates, until you get contracts signed. Um, I'm trying to figure out what kind of assurance, or if we're able to give any assurance to the, the community as to the stability of this 218 vote um, to um, where we're going in the future from here. Yeah, that's a legitimate complaint, you know, that, hey, five years ago we did this to finance the plant, and now you, you want more money. I and mean, that's, we hear, we hear things like that at other agencies too. Uh, I went back and I looked at the, you know, the old rate study and the Prop 218 notice, and even in there it was, it identified that, you know, it's based on preliminary estimates. If you get more grant funding, maybe the rates could be lower. If the project costs more, you might need higher rates. Because at the time it was acknowledged that those are just very preliminary cost estimates. Now you've got a bid in hand. So that's the big difference. You've actually got the design bid, winning bid in hand, and it sounds like you're working on negotiations to get that down, but you've got about a firm as a number as we, we've ever seen in this. Um, it's no longer estimates. So that's for the facility itself. We still are working with estimates on the force main lift station and for the injection system. So we have not completed design on those, nor would you normally um, have um, designs complete before you um, perform your rate analysis. Um, but what we do have is we are further along, we have a design engineer engaged who has um, uh, completed preliminary design of the, the lift station system um, uh, force main. Um, we have 
better cost analysis that we, that we did a few months ago. So we're um, assured of those. We have completed the first round of feasibility for the injection system. Um, and it shows that it is feasible. This next uh, round of geotechnical analysis will go to show exactly what that design is. But we feel we're carrying a um, high enough estimate that um, we, could, we can build that cost within the rates that we have. Again, as those cost numbers become refined and they likely um, no guarantees again, will come down in costs. That's where council will evaluate costs versus revenues in, in their rate setting uh, procedures every year. And I'll just add to that, you know, we, we did recently hire a new program manager, Corolla Engineers, Eric Caceres is the, the lead. And this is, this, excuse me, that's, this is what they do for a living. They, they work on projects of our size and much larger, and they are kind of our representative across the table from, you know, the bidders or proposers who, you know, certainly are looking to make money, but they, you know, they have great reputations to get projects done. But, you know, our program manager is there to make sure we get the best price for what we're seeking. In addition, being involved in the discussions around rates and, and sitting down with staff as well as the Blue Ribbon Commission, being relatively new because they didn't carry the project all the way to where they were, they. They ensure that we have sufficient reserves in there because they, you know, their firm's reputation is, <laughs> rides on this. So having that extra assurance that they went and did the extra homework to make sure that we put enough in there as far as reserves to ensure for those unforeseen things that may occur, um, that we'll be able to handle those. So that, that was comfort for me as a new city manager that we have a new set of eyes that was looked at, combed over all those things along with the Blue Ribbon Commission to ensure that this is the, the right amount to proceed forward with. It, it's always a bit of a speculation, as Alex said, but we have far firmer numbers than we did in 2015, when really the, the rate increase in 2015 was largely around moving the rates in the right direction. We hadn't had an increase in water in 20 years, probably for good reason, because we had sufficient revenues to cover ourselves, but then we weren't making our debt ratio, and we got a letter from Department of Water Resources, is that correct? No, from um, our um, yeah, funding partner, funder, uh, right. Central Coast Water Authority. Right, yeah. so they, they, we weren't meeting, meeting our debt ratios. In other words, we, we didn't have enough cash on hand to, to cover any kind of unforeseen incident or condition, and thus we needed to move the rates in a good direction. Okay, so that, and the sewer was part of that as well, and at the same time, we were really beginning to work on the, the wharf project, or the wastewater project at that time. And that was kind of a, a point in time said, okay, well, what's our best guess? And that, in a lot of ways, that's what that was in 2015. A lot has changed. Cayucas is no longer part of the project. We experienced a significant drought and city council adjusted their goals based on that. Uh, communities asking a good question, what happens if we run out of water? What are you gonna do next? How are you gonna respond to that? So the project evolved based on those, those components, but the rates in 2015 were really about setting, setting in, a, in the right direction. What's different now is that we have firmer numbers, and you know, we're not changing the scope of the project. You know, okay, this is thank the, you. Yeah. Um, I am also on a fixed income, like a lot of other people, um, and at times I have used, been on the CARE program also, so I'm well aware of the uh, impacts that these uh, increases will will place on everybody. I I tend to focus or to look at the base case scenario as opposed to the phased in scenario. I'm more of a bite the bullet, and because I can see the long long range savings by by paying a little more up front. Um, so I just wanted to let you know that that's my feelings, and I'll pass this on to John now. All right, um, let's see. I think most of my questions got answered one way or the other. Um, I was reading in the Blue Ribbon Report that one of the sources of savings you're expecting is to reduce the architectural features of the, of the buildings for the plant. Uh, what was the rough number which was associated with downgrading the architectural? Um, 
the question is, what are the rough numbers associated with? What, what, what the cost savings in, in construction of the, associated with going with a simpler architectural features? Um, I don't recall those numbers offhand. We'll have to get back to you, or if maybe I can call a friend if Joe happens to remember. Uh, no. Okay. Um, I can answer. I mean, we did we did have R R and M do the do an analysis of. Uh, of several different options, you know, whether we want to house staff both at the new facility and, and keep other staff down at the uh, existing plant location. Um, looking at, you know, we need to upgrade the facilities down there for a long-term commitment to those employees. Um, looking at that, maybe we don't do those reinvestments in, in those facilities. Largely what it came down to is that uh, there, there could be a million dollars in savings, maybe two million dollars in savings, but the loss in productivity um, could be a substantial issue. I think the Blue Ribbon Commission is looking for, well, if, if that's the case, what can you do to um, facilitate maybe a smaller or more refined facility up on the wharf, uh, the wharf project? And that's part of the discussions we'll be having with Black and Beach and Feelong. Um. Then some of the other questions that came to mind. Uh, Cayucas, would Cayucas have a veto on disposition of the cap, capital improvements in the property at the existing plant? Or would they, or, or do we have to share it? Is there? I, I think that's subject to our negotiations with Cayucas. I mean, there's options ranging from, you know, we buy them out to we sh continue to share the property and what gets done there. So it, it will be subject to negotiations with Cayuca Sanitary District. Is there, a, is there a, a defined property or boundary between the maintenance shops and the, the treatment plant? Um, there is no existing um, boundary. Um, we could create a, a boundary, of course, um, but there's no um, real property boundary that exists right now. Um, so theoretically, Cayucas owns some of the property or maintenance shops are owned, is that they, right? They own a um, undivided 40% interest in the entire common property. Okay. 40%. So that, that's confusing. Um, let's see what was else did I have. I, th I think my questions have been pretty well answered. So just make sure I've got the last thing. The, the injection, does it look like injection, whether we discharge is the cheapest way to, to get rid of our wastewater, whether we recycle it or not? Using injection as a disposal method is probably not the uh, cheapest way to get rid of wastewater. But what it does is uh, it ensures water availability in the lower Moro Basin for our wells. Okay. So, so it's a water supply option as opposed to a disposal project. Do you have a rough idea what the, the difference in just pumping it back to the, to the, to the uh, bay then would be what, 10 million or? Um, we did a scenario on a, um, a project that, which is secondary treatment only. Um, I think we had a slide on that. Um, the cost, yes. So um, the cost for a no recycling project because of the likely the inability to get subsidized financing would be roughly the same as a, the full project with subsidized financing for to phase it in or um, you know three dollars more a month than the base case financing. Okay. Thank you. 
Go ahead, Dave. I had a question about Perk Water. Um, a couple of residents sent me, and I'm, I assume all the other advisory board members, an email a copy of a Perk Water letter dated December 7, 2017. I believe this was submitted by Perk Water after the closing date of the request for qualifications process. Um, it might have been the date for the request for qualifications process. I think we okay. closed on the 7th. Uh, but it, it seems to have it either followed or, or was sent shortly before it closed. I don't know any, but it had to do with that. Why? It, it, my, my analysis of this letter is it, it was an explanation of why Perkwater didn't want, it, want to play in the city's process and uh, an, a, an invitation to negotiate with them outside of the process or, or their willingness to submit a proposal outside of the process. You had mentioned that they sent another letter no, they're, after they're, the RFP process had closed? No, they sent, that was, their costs were included in that letter. Okay. I'll have to look at it again. I didn't see the... Uh, There's a small table on that letter where they talk about uh, um, project costs. Okay, I'll look at it again. Okay. So I should be able to determine what the numbers that you were reading off your tablet from this letter. Yes. As far as the cost for them to, build, to provide a, a, a plant with secondary treatment, I think you said it was 105 million, and then you talked about another amount for providing facility with water reclamation at that's, 135 that's correct. million, something like that. Okay. All right. Well, I'll look at it again. And when uh, there was, I think there was a mention of there's going to be some report available now or coming out that's got data behind the different, the, provide the, the data behind the rate scenarios. Is that correct? Well, yeah. We've got a draft report that I mean, staff is just reviewing at this stage of the game where it's got a breakdown of everything and detailed cash flow projections. Tomorrow. Yeah, we're, we're sending that out tomorrow afternoon. And again, the uh, questions that came up today and will continue to come up will help probably clarify some points in the report. Okay, that's going to be posted on the yeah, website? Post on the website and tomorrow. Uh, do an addendum to the city council agenda for the okay. right. Thursday meeting. It okay, will be good. here at 6 o'clock. Okay, thank you. Uh, so this question is for Scott. On uh, page nine of the staff report, uh, there's a discussion of the two issues in regards to the billing options and the implementation of the rate increase, whether it's front-loaded or, or uh, stepped in. What are you looking for from these committees in this regard? I mean, just frankly, just kind of feedback. You know, what it, what's the feeling? Um, you know, I, ultimately you'll have a higher rate if you phase in, but it's only a few dollars. And for some folks in the community, just having incremental increases over several years may take some of the sting out of that, that significant increase of 41. Uh, understood. So yeah. you're not looking for an actual vote recommendation no, from each of the three committees? Yeah, from a logistical standpoint, it would be good to, for those committee members who are, you know, want to just to offer their their input, just say, you know, what you support on that, what do you support on property tax roll versus uh, monthly billing, just so we have a sense. And your council members here attending today, but, you know, um, we want to make sure we can bring that forward, not as a recommendation, but just as a kind of accumulation of the opinions here. Okay. Uh, well, just for my opinion, um, I would prefer to see it on the monthly water bill. I'm just thinking from a person who might have difficulty accumulating the money to pay a semi-annual property tax bill. It might be easier to pay it out of your monthly uh, check that you receive or whatever. And on the uh, implementation, I think I would, I would recommend a stepped increase uh, to get people the opportunity to fit it into their family budgets, um, even though it means a higher ultimate rate, and then with the hope that eventually the city will qualify for the SRF and that ultimate rate won't have to be as high. And I, I do have a, a question, because so I didn't stick around to the end of the meeting on Saturday, but what was the uh, upshot of the tabulation on those two items? Yeah, so the, the questions were around the phase-in versus the um, front-loaded increase, and then the other was the 
putting the wharf surcharge on the property tax roll or on the monthly, and it was 50-50, kind of, quite honestly. Um, yeah, on both questions. Yeah. Folks that I've talked to were more interested in the monthly um, for a number of reasons, part, partially for cash flow on the city side and partially for ease of budgeting uh, for their own accounting purposes. And also the upfront where the, where the 191 just sort of stays. But I had a question on that. So we have these five-year projections. And on the fifth year, if you do the phased increase, it's 194, right? Does that just stay then? I mean, that could actually stay 194 either, past the five right. years? Yeah, either scenario, it's, if it's the front load, it's 191 in perpetuity until there's a change. And then the stepped increase, it's 194 in perpetuity until there's a change. So, I mean, it could be $3 a month, but for more than that fifth year, I right. guess is what I'm getting at. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then just back to the, to the perk, um, the other feedback that I got from the community that was another, that was that PERC had um, promised low, kind of low cost in Santa Paula, and that those costs didn't bear out. And I was just wondering um, if you know folks involved here had heard that about PERC or had any experience with Santa Paula. Um, and I know that can be typical with construction, that low costs can be promised up front and, you know, in the end usually go up. So I didn't know if you'd heard that at all with PERC. Only what I've read in the um, articles in the Ventura County Papers, uh, City of Santa Pola recently purchased the facility um, from um, PERC Water um, at, I think it's five years after construction complete for over what the original construction cost is, but they um, were just basically cut their um, utility bills because they were saving the interest on using um, subsidized financing, SRF financing versus um, uh, paying the private financing that they did through um, Perk Water um, at a higher interest rate. I don't have any questions, but if we're being asked to, uh, to weigh in on the phased-in approach, uh, I'd be in favor of that, anything that kind of lessens the load. And, and you know, being hopeful that when we get out to that point, we're, we're seeing, as John mentioned, you know, an SRF loan or some other things that might, you know, keep that cost down. I think that's a possibility for sure. Uh, with respect to the uh, property tax versus monthly bill, I was feeling kind of ambivalent about that, but I would favor the monthly bill. I, I, that lump sum idea is, is a little bit troubling. I thought that, well, okay, if it's um, going to be borne by the property owner, that would be better because then renters you know, might not have it passed on. But it seems to me that that's probably not too realistic in most situations. If the um, uh, tenant isn't paying directly for water, then certainly it's going to be reflected in some kind, you know, some form of higher rent. Um, so that's where I stand on that. That's all I have. Thanks, Jesse. Yeah, I kind of echo both of those um, both of those observations. I'm in favor of uh, the monthly and the uh, the phased in approach. Um, just to kind of. Cut, cut to the chase there. I, I did have one other comment um, regarding the uh, the demolition as, as Chris brought up um, and any future redevelopment. I think, uh, well, I know some considerable thought has gone into that, but given the GPAC update right now, I, I think it's a good time to maybe start looking at um, possible revenues from future redevelopment um, and how that could impact our rates and, uh, and the, you know, short to long term, so I would encourage you to look at that. <clears throat> okay, as I said earlier, I wanted to comment um, on the Blue Ribbon Commission report, which uh, I want to um, uh, thank the commissioners that put this together. It was a very good report, really, really helpful. 
Um, and in it, uh, something, a few things that caught my eye and some questions that I had, but on page nine of the Blue Ribbon Commission report, which is page 19 of our staff report, um, in the second paragraph under section E, it says the design of the route for the pipe to transport the recycled water to the injection well, injection well fields in Moro Valley has not been determined. Um, kind of bothers me, but to me that means that there isn't a water reclamation facility until this has been determined. Um, on page 11 of the, of the report, which is page 21 of the staff report, it says that um, the city is aware that until two th 2038 is likely that the most economical way to deal with the water recycled by the WRF will be to inject it into the groundwater and leave it there. Really. And somehow that doesn't sound like we're recycling a reclamation project. Page 14 of the report, which is page 24 of our staff report, it says cost attributable to both water and sewer will be apportioned as a ratio between water and sewer. Does this ratio apply to things like, uh, say, Corolla's contract with the city? Is there a split there? Do, do both enterprise funds share in the cost? Um, does the enterprise, both enterprise funds, pay for anything that involves both aspects of the project? Um, and can you apply this ratio to, say, the membranes at the new facility whereby secondary and tertiary treatment occurs together? Last year, the city, and maybe Alex remembers this, that we drew a line between secondary and tertiary for the split between the two enterprise funds. And now they, they want to include all of the uh, membranes through tertiary treatment as part of the sewer enterprise fund to pay for. Um, I believe the appropriate split was back where we could determine a ratio in that membrane cost that some of it is attributable to water reclamation and some of it's just sewage treatment. On uh, page uh, 17 of the uh, Blue Ribbon Commission report, which is page 27 of our staff report, it, it lists um, uh, capital project prioritizations, uh, one being the um, projects that are integral to the new treatment plant. I'm assuming that they mean the, the WRF. Um, these projects now become part of the project description for the entire WRF project. Um, so did the IRS, did the draft environmental impact report addressed those integral other parts that we haven't described yet. And then the last thing, it's kind of a reiteration of what I said before. On page 23 of the report, which is page 33 of our staff report, it says, at this time we believe the best approach is to assume the separate routing of the piping, the IPR water line. When will we be sure? Uh, to me, we have so many unknowns about this project that could run into so many obstacles. Just the pipeline routing alone seems very um, uncertain to me. And, and we need to nail these things down before we really have all the working parts of a project. That's, that's my concerns. Val? I'll just comment on the um, two things that we were asked. And that is, one is in regard to um, <clears throat> the surcharge, um, I would prefer to see it as a monthly bill billing. Um, there's a part of me, too, that uh, prefers the front end load, which is the max amount of cash that's be available to fund this project, although I understand that the reasoning, too, that to phase it in with the idea that um, other funds will be coming in to help supplement, so I'm kind of on the fence on that one. But if we, anyway. Uh, Scott or staff, any further response? Or are you looking for us to maybe take a straw poll on these two items? We have a, a list of questions that came from CFAC member Bart Beckman that we'd like to go through if that's OK. Oh, perfect, yes, thank you. OK. Um, before those, just address a couple of um, Paul's question. Um, or at least one of them. The uh, pipeline costs, uh, the higher cost is being carried forward um, in the cost estimate. So we have those. Um, 
I've said this a bunch of times, we probably won't know how much this project costs exactly until we write that final check. Um, but at some point we have to rely upon the estimates we have to move forward with it because we can't write that final check until we have um, um, rates in place and long-term funding. Um, now maybe we can, I will work through, let me get the right. Uh, uh, Mr. Beckman submitted uh, a list of questions, um, and I'll probably call on my colleagues here to help me answer some of these. Um, one of them is, um, you all have these questions, so I'm going to paraphrase um, um, the, the questions. Uh, first one's on WIFIA terms. 35-year um, term was used for part of the debt, calculation 49%. Um, the loan required. Um, um, he believes that CFAC should make a recommendation as to what the long-term loan should be considered. And uh, partial response is uh, change in a loan term would have minimal effect on the rates. And perhaps um, Alex can add to that if. Uh, is this the question about reducing the term? Reducing yeah. The term? Yeah, there's always concern, you know, the longer the term of a loan, the more interest you pay. But by the same token, inflation's working against that. So if you're getting a subsidized loan that's 3% and inflation's 3%, it's a wash. It doesn't always, doesn't always work like that. But certainly you end up paying a little more interest if it's spread out over a longer time frame. But it's not a tremendous amount more interest, and it just helps keep the, um, the dollar amount a little bit lower for the rates. But, you know, you could... There are agencies that sometimes do a big projects and they want to finance it over 25 years instead of 30 or 35. And there, you know, it just means pay more now, less later. Uh, and even if you did a 35 year now, I don't think there's anything that precludes you from paying it off early if you wanted to. Because again, with the WIFI loan, the rate's not going to be that much different. A tiny bit maybe, whether it's a 30 or 35 year, just the way they establish their rates. So you're going to be paying the same interest rate either way. And um, so if you want to apply more principal and pay down interest, uh, maybe there's a way to do that after a certain period of time so you could have the ability to repay it in 32 years or whatever if the, if the finance is availed. Um, he, he was wondering what the um, assumptions were in the financing costs. And they're specified in the, um, the report here. They'll be in the report that'll go out this afternoon. Uh, tomorrow afternoon, WIFIA was 3.25 for 35 years, SRF planning loan 1.7, 10 years, not an assumption, it's what we have in our um, loan document, and bonds 4.7% for 30-year um, um, term. Um, his question, he applauds the, um, um, the efforts on accounting for the CIPs noting that $16 million in the 2015 to 18 uh, uh, vote were almost entirely ignored. Um, uh, our response is thank, thank you for the comments and we'll um, continue to uh, move uh, that, those projects forward. I think we have a better plan um, with our CIP that we've created. We actually have in the former um, master plans. There was no timing associated with those projects. It was just a list of projects that needed to be done. So I think we have a better um, assessment of those and when they need to be done. Um, uh, the next question is regard to um, um, I and I improvements in the collection system versus. Uh, oh, excuse me. Um, uh, I and I inflow and infiltration. It's the stormwater that gets into the gets into the system. I'm sure I'll say it many more times, and Scott's going to ask me to tell you what it is. So we'll all have it memorized shortly. Um, um, the weighing of improvements in the collection system for I and I improvements versus um, treatment at the. Um, um, uh, wastewater site. So the most critical design factor is our maximum uh, month flow, which is about 1.2 MGD or million gallons per day. Um, and the peak hour flow, which is a lot of that inflow, is 8 MGD. Um, 
there's the cost for handling that H8 MGD at the treatment plant site um, are probably are likely less than making all the improvements to the collection system. Um, so we'll continue to make those improvements, but we need to be able to handle that inflow and infiltration. It, my experience is we'll never fix it all. No city ever has, unless like Los Osos, and put in a brand new collection system um, from the very beginning. In 20 years, they're going to be fixing their I and I problems. Our collection system dates from the 50s, so of course we're repairing that I and I. And we, as I've pointed out before, we work on the, our collection system every day. We have crews out there that are inspecting, cleaning, and repairing lines. So um, that's um, um, something that we we'll work on every day. Um, So the next question is regard to did the um, design build proposers input into the life cycle costs? Um, um, they, they did for cost evaluation purposes, but we prepared, it didn't include um, personnel costs, and um, we're going to right size our um, personnel costs. Our um, utilities manager has about 27 years experience running these um, facilities and a lot of his experience is um, staffing plants, or determining the right amount of staffing for them. So we're gonna right size our staffing for that facility. Um, a lot that will help that is having all our personnel at one um, site so they can be cross-trained and work on different aspects of it. In fact, our, um, you know, we are looking through, through, through attrition to probably, um, as we move forward to this new treatment plant, to uh, downsize the number of folks that we have working in um, water and wastewater. Um, uh, he believes that the demolition should be included in um, the um, uh, cost estimate and included in the, um, uh, in the costs that go into the um, 218 um, um, rate calculation. I think we've explained that, that uh, it's a outer year item and as we move forward, we expect um, that um, we'll, there will be cost savings through the project and a high likelihood of getting SRF funds, so we believe we can fund that within the um, rates that we're proposing. In addition, um, we need to coordinate um, the demolition with the Cayuca Sanitary District and determine what proportion of the demolition costs um, they will be paying. Um, future 218, um, he was a little unclear what that, uh, what that means. Um, this 218 is to set our rates to um, fund this large infrastructure project and to um, work on critical CIPs over the next five years and to operate this facility. Um, we've all experienced inflation. I'm sure it's not gonna stop the minute that we adopt rates. We'll have to reevaluate rates and I would guess that there will be a future 218 sometime in our future, but council with the adoption of a resolution that will right size the rates each year, will you know um, uh, make sure that the rates are appropriate and won't go out for a 218 until it's absolutely necessary. Um, but as we've s seen from our past history, uh, we um, not having a water rate increase in 30 years now, well, 20 years, sorry, 20 something years, 1996 was our. Uh, uh, water rate increase, we increase water rates in 2015, uh, so close to 30 years. Um, that last year, we didn't meet debt service coverage, plus we were operating in a $900,000 deficit. So we were pulling money out of our reserves to pay operational costs. That's an unsustainable um, plan for any water utility or any utility uh, whatsoever. 
um, uh, construction of a road leading to the um, uh, South Bay Boulevard site, yes, that is included in the cost estimates. There's a access road that'll go from the intersection of Teresa Drive and um, um, South Bay Boulevard up to the treatment plant site, and that's included in the cost estimates. Um, uh, proposal to install our um, um, lines that go from the lift station to um, the treatment plant go up Quintana Road. Um, and we talked about possible dis disruptions. Yes, there will be disruptions, but we will work with those businesses. We're not going to propose shutting down the road. Um, maybe, ex maybe there could be nighttime construction where we'll shut down the road. I've, I've experienced that in my um, construction career where sometimes it does take the full width of the road to build something, and you make it at a time that's... Um, probably least convenient to build in, but most convenient for the operating public. We have alternatives. We have Kennedy um, um, that connects through to Kuntana. There may be detours, but we'll work with the community to make sure that disruption is as minimal as possible. Um, and we'll be working with our design engineers to make sure that we've right-sized those facilities, put them in the oppor most opportune place to minimize that, that impact. Um, how is the city engaging the community? Um, meetings like this, our uh, meeting that we had at, on Saturday, um, we'll be using our um, 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 uh, council meetings, um, flyers, newsletters, the water bill inserts to make uh, um, uh, sure that we've communicated uh, with everybody. Um, many of the members, or some of the members, sit on multiple um, advisory boards and are can help to inform the others. His comment that you know CFAC hasn't really been involved in it. Um, we have a representative on CFAC on Public Works Advisory Board uh, that has involved in the, the a little bit in the CIP uh, development or review. Um, <coughs> a member that sits on WERFCAC um, that has been involved in this project for uh, quite extensively. Um, and CFAC is here at the table when it's important. This is directly related to CFAC. Rates um, are in their wheelhouse. Um, The um, question regarding that it's a 27% increase over maximum rates approved in 2015, um, he believes we should have taken out the, the, uh, the capital costs that we didn't do and recalculate that rate increase. Um, I differ with that opinion. I, we collected those rates. They went into our accumulation fund, and they'll be used to fund either pay as you capital or for this um, um, worth projects, and we've included those in our um, rate analysis. I think I hit everything, unless any of the board members want me to expand on anything. No, just the last point, please. Uh, he states, uh, the CFAC member states that 215 vote included 16 million of issues in addition to the base plant of 75 million. Is that a correct statement? They may be talking about, back in the, the prior rate study, if I remember correctly, uh, the city was gearing up to do, I think it was an expensive tank replacement, so there was even, oh. in the water fund, there was this notion, hey, they, they might have okay. to do a temp, because they had no fund reserves, mm -hmm. but they, they might have to do a bar, you know, borrow three, four million dollars, I forget the amount, um, to fund it, so that some of it was financed, but maybe they're looking at the whole 10-year period, because that was one of the purposes of that last rate study, was to phase in funding, so you did generate a pay-as-you-go funding stream for capital needs. Um, Some of that but, was ca uh, water yeah, rate. Yeah, but again, again, every dollar that goes to water stays in water, so the mm -hmm. fact that you thought you might be doing a capital project two years ago that you're doing now, it doesn't mean that the rates were wrong, it just means a little mistiming. Um, so the revenues are still going to the purpose for which they were collected at the end of the day, from, from my perspective. Okay. We see this all the time. Yeah. 
a quick question. It could it have also have been that you know because of the uncertainty with respect to the you know the construction of the of the plant and and how that was all going to be set up, that it was wise to defer some of those capital improvements because I mean we, they could have been made and then they they wouldn't have been part of the you know the plan they wouldn't have they wouldn't have been good choices on the on the main street line that is definitely true um, also without Cayucas in the mix we have a different need for a main street line it's a jointly owned line um, so it will be of different size when we uh, repair and replace that line than it would have been um, five years ago um, the also there's a statement that we had 3.5 million dollars for automatic re meter reading that $3.5 million line item was for the nutmeg tank um, replacement, uh, going from a 100,000 gal gallon tank to a million gallon storage tank. Thank you, Rob. Yeah, that was. And I just wanted awesome. to add one thing. Uh, Commissioner Donley mentioned that, you know, if we were waiting for these projects to determine kind of the proper scope and sizing, that they thus mm -hmm. should be included in the uh, EIR. It's, it's a good question, but. They're not the same project. It's not part of the same project. It's just the timing made sense to hold on until we knew what the facility was and how they could kind of speak to each other as far as numbers. But it, they're not part of the same project. It's just they inform one another. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Don. Could I just go back to this um, monthly versus tax rolls and how that decision would affect the 218? I think you went over it maybe on Saturday. Like, if, if the decision was that these were going to come out of tax rolls before the 218, would that affect how people vote on the 218? Like, who gets to vote? We, regardless of the methodology of billing, we would, as was discussed during the council resolution adoption on June 13th, I believe, uh, is that we would send it to the parcel owner as well as the, if there's a rate payer, it could be this, that could be the same person. The parcel owner could also be the rate payer, but there could be scenarios where the rate payer is a tenant, so they would also receive the notice. And any one of those individuals could submit a, a protest, and it would count as a protest as long so, as they pay pay the rate. Okay. Yeah. So it doesn't affect at all who gets to submit a protest. That's right. Which yeah, way we that money is We looked is at that closely out. today, and just yeah. you know, could could a could a tenant make a decision on a, a tax roll? From our vantage point, the bigger principle here is that. It, you know, more people have an opportunity to participate in that. Um, I've, I've got about four brief questions, um, and if I have my choice, pay it, pay up front is my preference, and I don't care whether it's monthly or, or, pay, or tax rates. Uh, for every dollar we increase the down payment, you know, the cash, how much does that reduce the ongoing costs after completion of the construction? Uh, I, I'm going to have to get back to you on that. That's a good question. Yeah, for every every increase in that, that charge, how much less debt service does it generate down the line? I guess it depends on how quickly you're charging it also, but I'm, I'm assuming I, I at the time that, 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 you know, you're going to do an SRF loan or, and we're also going to do a WIFI loan. So whenever those things kick in, what, how much can we reduce those loans or or a, or a facility bond for every how much can we reduce uh, for every dollar we spend how much is the our bond or debt stuff reduced and you probably have to look at all three of them but I assume it's facility or with you well it's interesting because when we looked at uh, you know under the base case scenario you're, you're generating 4.3 million at least in the last this, what this version of base case I've lately um, you're generating $4.3 million, and it's, you know, results in about 300000 a year of debt service. And what was the difference? It was about $3 a month. So real rough estimate, each dollar, each, um, each dollar increase, well, maybe I'm not sure I'm understanding the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. well, that's, that's basically it. Translates it's, to about $100,000 maybe mixed between water and sewer. So um, each dollar raised... There's so many moving parts to this question that, you know, it depends on when you're discharging and everything else. But let me take a look and, and come back with some number on that. Cause yeah, you, it, just it, to give you a sense for yeah, each dollar, what does that do? Each dollar more in the near term, what does that do in the, in the long term? Okay. 
And then the adjusting of water rates, that, does that ha happen on an annual basis? You have to review rates, make sure they're still appropriate every year? Um, that's going to be our proposal in the um, rate review resolution is that um, through the budget process, we'll review uh, revenues and expenses and um, council will make the appropriate decision whether they need to implement um, the maximum rate increase. All right, keep it, reduce it. Um, okay, and then the other one is I heard some nasty rumor that you would convert the treatment plant maintenance area to open space rather than to the highest and best use. Uh, what is the city's position on that? There is no official city business perspective, or city position on that, sorry. Um, as I said, the last, last real decision making on this was that city council felt this was a, a, a better priority to tackle next year um, because we have, we have the wharf project, we have our one water and that's nearing its completion. We have the general plan, local coastal plan uh, update. We have, you know, a couple new people, leadership positions here. So based on the timing of a lot of other things, that decision was put off until next year to really um, A, see where we are with the war, first of all, and then, you know, if 218 is successful and we move forward, then we have a real conversation to be had. So that was the last official position taken by city council was, let's make this a priority to tackle next year. Okay, so you don't, it, it's not, not a position. I mean, I mean, it just the Coastal Commission, there was a r rumor the Coastal Commission would rather have open space than any sort of improvements. Um, I'm, okay, I, that's about as far as I can go. Any other members of PIVA have some final questions? Jan? I just have another comment. It's, I didn't realize you wanted our opinion on whether we could have monthly or on our tax bill, I would prefer the monthly one, and it doesn't make any difference to me whether it's phased in or loaded up front. Just and on that same note, um, I I think I would lean towards the monthly, and I'd, I'd lean towards the phased in approach. Anything else? I'm okay with monthly and the, and the phased in approach too. I've already weighed in on the question, but just by way of historical context, because I think it might be helpful, uh, at the California Coastal Commission meeting in Pismo Beach where they told us basically not to build our wastewater treatment plant, you know, where it is currently, uh, several of the members of the commission, I was, I was in attendance at that meeting, and several of the members of the commission said, uh, don't be thinking that we're going to approve anything in that location. It, it really comes down to the Coastal Commission, and one commissioner specifically said, if you think you're going to turn it into a park and plop down a bunch of picnic benches, um, that's still going to have to go through review, and we're going to have, you know, some, it's going to experience serious review. We're just not going to automatically approve that. So that would certainly be the case for anything that's built there, even though it would be a private enterprise and they're assuming more of a risk than a city can assume on behalf of its residents, there, nothing is automatic there, is what we were told. And, and it would be subject to very, very strict review. The second thing, and then I'll leave it, um, with respect to the, to the wells, because I heard one comment here with respect to, well, why are we injecting water into those wells? Well, the wells are fouled with nitrates. It's been a concern for many years, for the entire time that I've lived here, and I've lived here since the year 2000. So those, those wells are useless. They are, they're not an asset in our water portfolio, and they need to be. And by injecting uh, the, the, the clean water into those wells, we will dilute the nitrates to a point where that, uh, that water uh, would pass standards and could be used. It's a very important component of this project. It shouldn't be dismissed, and for the extra dollar fifty a month it's going to cost everybody, it's certainly well, uh, well worth it. We've, we've stuck our, hand, our, head in the sands in the, uh, our head in the sand in this town for too long. Back in 1964, the, when the town was originally incorporated, the city council was given the option of taking water from Whale Rock Reservoir and they declined because they thought they had enough water. And um, one member 
uh, got a chance to talk to him before he died, and that was the decision that, they, that he most regretted as a member of the city council, that, they uh, that that city council declined uh, water supply from Whale Rock Reservoir. There is not more water, only less water. We heard on Saturday that Cape Town, South Africa will run out of water in six months. An entire city will literally run out of water in six months. So we need to be looking very carefully at, at varying our water portfolio and making sure that we revive those wells in the Morro Valley again. Thank you. Anything else? Um, I'll just conclude with, I didn't tell you my preference. Uh, I'm still slightly leaning to the property tax because of the incentive for, for maybe helping uh, or future help to low-income voters, but I can support either, certainly. And the other thing I was, I was gonna uh, mention is that on the invoice versus, uh, um, excuse me, 30-year versus 35-year financing on, on the plan, it looked like it was about, using a three and a quarter percent, it looked like it was about a $7 delta. In other words, you, we would, if we wanted to retire that loan in 30 years, it looks like it would take about, uh, seven dollars a month and that's on a hundred twenty one million dollar loan and if we don't have to borrow that much obviously uh, but but if you look at the cost of money it was almost a wash because you're paying off in years 30 through 35 at highly you know inflated dollars or deflated so so anyways um, and I so I would uh, prefer the phased in approach as well so Rick or Scott, do you need anything further from us? Do you need a, I think it's pretty obvious. Uh, well, maybe not on the phase-in or the front load. Yeah. Um, let's see. I, I don't have any additional comments. Um, and it doesn't look like staff has anything additional. I, I do want to thank everybody that did come out to um, listen to us and to be a part of this, and also staff for the work that they've done. I mean, this this is a project that has been going on for, you know, almost a decade or more, and um, it's not easy, and it's going to be expensive. Public works, um, you know, capital improvement projects are expensive, especially nowadays. Things that were built 50 years ago, um, they fall apart. So I just want to thank everyone, especially all the members of the board, and I will adjourn our... Oh, can I offer oh, one thing? One more Just thing, Scott. From staff okay. side, we want to thank all of the committee members here today and those who were unable to attend uh, for their tremendous um, contribution to the community, both on this project and a whole host of others. And also, heartfelt thanks to the Blue Ribbon Commission for giving us hundreds of hours co combination between the four members and, and really pushing the city to, to think differently and to... Uh, to bring forward the best that we could for this project. So thank you. Thank you. With that, thank then you. I will Echo. adjourn the PWI meeting to our next regular one and let Barbara finish it. And, and likewise, CFAC and, and WARF CAC. So thank you all.